going to call this meeting to order. It is, it is one, you, you can't hear. We want to start this meeting, please. Do we have a motion to authorize electronic participation? Motion to allow electronic participation. If we can't have quiet in here, we're going to have to clear this room. Please. Do we have a motion, Dr. Chase? Yes, motion to allow uh, or authorize electronic um, participation. Second. We have a motion and second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. So Dr. Warner is participating electronically. That brings us to the approval of the agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the agenda? I think it says roll call, doesn't it? Oh, roll call. All right, Dr. Chase? Here. Ms. Guy? Here. Ms. Halstead? Here. Ms. Healy? Here. Ms. Randall? Here. Ms. Siegman? Here. And Dr. Warner? Here. Thank you, Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. Do we have a motion to approve the agenda? Uh, Madam Chair, I would move to approve the agenda with an amendment, which is to reduce the length of public comment from three minutes to two minutes. Um, Second. I, I, I ask, I, well, I guess we could have some discussion, yeah. It's been seconded. All right, we have a motion and a second discussion. Yeah, I'm, Chase, I'm asking for this. Um, as, as many of you know, I had a loss in my family on, on Sunday. Um, this meeting came up. This is my third meeting this week. And um, I'm, I'm just exhausted. So I, I would ask my fellow board members to um, help me out here. Can you all turn your mics up? We turn them on when we speak because otherwise there's a static. Oh, turn them off. I think he said pop. I think he said pop. I don't know how to turn it up. Um, do we have any other discussion? Um, Madam Clerk, how many speakers have signed up? 30, ma'am. 30? Um, yes, 30. Could I, could I just ask for a show of hands, is there anyone who has not signed up who wishes to speak tonight? 30 times 3 is 90 minutes. Okay, I see um, less than five hands. So that means we'd have 35. Um, I, I, I would like to note that I received one email today by someone that asked that we not cut it short because of the uh, ability to write the equivalent of three minutes. Um, it, would, it looks like it would save us approximately 35 minutes. I mean, I'm certainly you know, willing to, to hear from the board, and I understand where you are, um, Dr. Chase, but with, if, if in fact we do have 35, 35 more minutes is not, um, in, in, in the big picture, that, that many more minutes. Um, I certainly don't think anybody wants to be here till midnight then, again. Then Madam Chair, will you be limiting the length of public comment in case people arrive late who plan to speak as well? That's, that's a possibility. It's, it's the, uh, we have to, it has to be a predetermined amount of time. So we have 35 speakers at three minutes each, just, just about, and that would allow us a little more uh, time, and I didn't see any other uh, persons here. So how, how about if we, we say a maximum of two and a half hours in case there are um, other people that come in that that wish to speak so that if we if we limit the um, amount of time for the speakers to two hours and 35 minutes and and that doesn't mean three minutes into that is how many speakers um, can come forward in two hours and 30 minutes is that I I'm okay with limiting because it, I, it's a lot of the same individuals who we just saw and just heard from and we've got multiple venues for people to communicate with us. And I have a meeting tonight that was been on my books for six months, and I plan to make it. And it, it is this evening. <laughs> so 
I, I'm okay with it as well. Um, ex excuse me, we are not accepting comments from the audience. We are not able to conduct our business with interruptions, and if there are comments, we will ask you to leave. I'm sorry, I'll try to speak up. My throat is sore tonight, I apologize. <clears throat> so, um, I'm okay with limiting because other, of previous engagements. Board members? I'm okay with limiting. Ms. Holstead? I mean, I'm okay with limiting as well because I think the public is anxious to get through, have their voices heard, not just through comments, but with this board's decision. That's right. The sooner we finish comments, the sooner we have our discussion and, and have a decision. I um, am, uh, I have no problem limiting the time each speaker has. I do prefer to give everybody who attempts to get here the opportunity to speak. I don't know how to magically predict that, but um, I'd like to keep that in, in mind. Okay, Dr. Warner. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to, I have no problem with limiting the amount of time. Um, you know, two minutes seems like a reasonable expectation for each speaker, speaker and then we can accommodate anybody who shows up afterwards. Um, Ms. Guy, what time do you have to leave? I don't plan to leave early. I just have a meeting that was already determined and I've already given my commitment and so I'd like to be there. So um, I would love to, to stay to the end, but I can't stay till midnight. Also, I have a kid at home that I have to put to bed. So um, I'm gonna stay as long as I can. I mean, I'll run to my car if I have to. Okay, well, well I, I'm going to, um, I guess I get to set the minutes, but I, I would, I, I'm, I'm going to go with two and a half hours, which is 150 minutes, which if we leave it at three, we can certainly ask the speakers to try to uh, condense their speeches or the, what they would like to send to the, the message to the board. Uh, but that would allow us to have approximately um, high 40s in speakers. We've had 25 sign up, less than five others indicated. So that, that gives us more than adequate time. So a maximum of two and a half hours. And um, Madam Clerk, if you could s yes, set that time and that, that includes time coming up and down. So I'm gonna ask you to, to read you know, five at a time so people can be ready as a courtesy to their fellow citizens to be come down here and talk. Yes. Um, I, I read 73 digital comments before I came this evening. Are individuals allowed to make multiple public comments given that they both go into the, they go into the minutes? No, the, the commentary here, which we read the other night and it's part of the um, agenda this evening, says that individuals desiring to submit their comments in writing rather than in person may do so using the public comment form. So if someone has submitted digital comments, they are not going to be speaking here this evening. And that's, that's consistent with what we announced the other night. That, that is a general policy. It's not just for this meeting. It is for the digital comments. So Madam Clerk, if you could call the first five. Yes, oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just want to get started. Just made the amendment, yes. Okay, all right. So do we need to vote so, for the amendment? So the, um, well, it's, vote for the it, agenda. I don't think we have to, um, to vote for the, well, we have, we're, we're approving the agenda. All right, so, so the chairman is declaring that the citizen comment will be limited to a maximum of 150 minutes. And that will start when the first speaker comes down. Yes, ma'am. All right, so with that change in the agenda, all in favor of approving, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. All right, motion carries unanimously. Now, Madam Clerk, if you okay. can read the first five speakers and after the fourth, read the next five after that. Yes, ma'am, the first what five is, wait are. Minute. Wait a minute. Oh, yeah. Just can't get to this public comment, <laughs> folks, sorry. I'm so excited. Yeah, I just wanna get started. All right, you've heard this before, but we will read it again. Three minutes are allotted to each speaker or group. Speakers are encouraged to provide a copy of the comments to the board clerk. Speakers shall identify themselves by name 
and organizational affiliation if the spokesperson represents an organization. Speakers shall also announce the purpose or topic of their comments. The chairperson reserves the right to restrict the total citizen comments to a predetermined maximum number of minutes with the approval of the board. And that, as we announced, will be 150 minutes. Individuals desiring to submit their comments in writing rather than in person may do so using the public comment form at the website number. There is a two. 1,500 character maximum on the form, which is equivalent to approximately three minutes of speaking time. The deadline to submit the public comment form for this meeting was 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time today. Citizen comment which is profane, abusive, or which threatens imminent physical harm shall be ruled out of order by the chairperson. Although the board provides the opportunity for citizen comment, Individuals desiring to register complaints against division employees or division programs, services, or activities may also utilize the procedures outlined in Stafford County Public School Policy 1113 Public Complaints. I would ask that everyone that comes to speak to the board address your comments to the board, not to the audience, to the board. And also, I would ask that you please Please show respect for everyone that's here tonight, whether they agree with you or don't agree with you. People are here because they care and they deserve respect. Madam Clerk. Yes, ma'am. Clifford Heinzer, Jason Kaiser, Kelly Grissom, Michelle Wickman, and Shannon Fingerholtz. Good evening. My name is Clifford Heinzer, and I'm the chair of the Stafford County Democratic Committee. Given the continuing threat that COVID poses to our community, the logical course of action is to maintain the mask mandate as long as we can under the law. I'd like to pose a few, a few questions for you to consider. First is, do we have a plan for how we will protect immunocompromised individuals in our county if we can do nothing to stop the spread of COVID in our schools. If masks do not work, then why did a report from Arizona reveal that schools in two of the state's most populous counties were three and a half times more likely to have COVID-19 outbreaks if they did not have a mask requirement at the start of the school compared with schools requiring universal masking from day one? Why did another report find that Two weeks following the start of the school, the average change in pediatric COVID-19 case rates was lower among counties with school mask requirements. Did you know that approximately 24% of America has been infected by COVID, but in Japan, it is only 3%. In South Korea, it is only 2%. And in Taiwan, it's only 1%. If masks do not work, then why are COVID infections so much lower in countries where mask wearing is the norm? If you give every parent the choice to refuse the protection of a mask or vaccination against COVID, will measles, mumps, or polio immunizations be next? If you wonder why there is such a divide among those who have been speaking tonight Note how often some speakers referring to, the, to their rights use I, me, and my, while other speakers referring to their community use we, us, and our. I would just point out for those who are more interested in that particular topic, a book, American Character by Colin Woodward, a history of the epic struggle between individual liberty and the common good. Thank you for your time and for hearing me for a third time this week. Thank you. Good job. Good evening.
Beaver School Board, Dr. Taylor. My name is Jason Kaiser. I'm from a quiet district. I'm here to exercise my civic right to address the school board and all the members here about the mask mandate. <clears throat> Obviously, we've been talking about mask mandates for a few weeks, a couple months now, and it's a good thing that, that we're here at this moment because the tide has turned, I believe, not just here in our county, but across America, we're starting to see the tide turning with these masks. Parents are standing up. It's time for a change. This issue began again, you know, somewhere sometime in, in November of 21. We went through December, through January, and here we are in February. And I think there's been a sufficient amount of time for preparation for school members, for parents, for teachers, for the board, in order for us to move forward. Now, <clears throat> Dr. Taylor is pretty confident in his, his plan that he can get our kids out of masks, get them into school, and there's not going to be any problems starting tomorrow. And I think that's a great plan. I think if we execute that, I think all these little issues, the infighting, but that'll all go away. And we can move on to other important issues. Um, I simply ask that you allow our children to breathe once again and take that vote tonight in order to give parents the choice to remove the mask from their children. Allow us to make the decision for them. Now, I'm here to tell you that we as parents, we as parents, We'll be here every single board meeting to discuss the issues that are going on within our schools. And it's not just the mask mandate, because there are other issues that are with, I think that we need to deal with. It's time that we put a check on the radical ideology that's plaguing our school system. We need to get back to teaching our children how to be successful and proud Americans. This racially divisive teachings that are occurring started out in Northern Virginia and have creeped down into our schools. That needs to come to an end. And I'm confident that, they, that Dr. Taylor will be a partner with parents so that we can weed out all that negativity so that we can move forward in the positive progress for our community. Thanks for your time, and thank you for voting for Parents' Choice. I'm here once again spending time with you all Instead of hey, sir, being could you give us your name? Kelly Grissom. Thank you. I'm a parent to an eighth grader here in the county, and I spoke to you before, just a couple weeks ago. And instead of being at my school, coaching the children of our community, as I have done the entire time that you have been messing with this issue, the entire time, two years, no masks, no mandates, no problems, not a couple miles from here, but instead of me being over there helping our kids, I'm here again saying it's safe for kids not to have masks. I have two years of evidence. Second, as I've said before, we don't need your help on this issue. Just let it go. Just let it go. Fix the issue. I didn't figure out something that you guys can't figure out. That's not what happened. You can figure it out. It's pretty simple. Let parents decide how to manage risk in their household. Grown adults decide how to manage risk and they will manage risk. Just as we have done for two years, thousands of kids, hundreds of kids every day. No masks, no problems, no issues. I'm not lying to you. It's the truth. Kids are safe without masks. I don't want to argue this bit of data, that bit of data. I'm telling you, from this community, someone who spent more than a decade training all the kids around here, talking to them, my heart with them, totally involved in their lives, way more than I suspect, probably some of you, I suspect. Stop it. Stop. Fix it. We don't need your help. Fix the issue, please. No mask for kids. It's stupid at this point. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board, Dr. Taylor. I'll try and be brief, because I know we all kind of want to get home tonight. My name is Michelle Wickman, Garrisonville, two kids in Stafford, North High School, uh, North Stafford High School, world's greatest high school. We're going to revisit the crap test tonight to discuss accuracy and relevance. Earlier this week, we heard a lot of misinformation, most of which I won't bother to address for several reasons, but primarily because it's now less relevant due to legal actions. 
Those actions are highly relevant as they determine your path forward. Some said the Virginia Supreme Court upheld the governor's executive order. This is inaccurate. The Supreme Court dismissed the case on technicalities and expressly stated that they had no opinion on the legality of EO2. What's accurate is the Senate has passed SB 739, which requires an opt-out to masking policies, but has yet to pass in the House. It was implied that the bill made this discussion unnecessary. That's also inaccurate. The fine print of the bill is really important. So what's accurate right now is it goes into effect July 1st. You're not legally obligated to provide parents an opt-out prior to then, though an emergency clause, if passed, may alter that date. So now the conversation must change because the most relevant aspects are when you're legally obligated to make a change and the best way to safely and appropriately handle that transition. You know what this will ask of our already overworked educators. Changing the rules mid-year and planning for entirely new mitigation strategies will not be an easy pivot. Despite other claims we heard Tuesday, the removal of a mask requirement isn't going to result in teachers suddenly appearing to fill vacancies. I'll remind you that following the governor's issuing of EO2, SEA heard from more than 50 staff members who expressed an intent to resign immediately. In order to minimize this, please provide us with the maximum transition time possible under the law. Just days ago, the CDC and other reputable health experts reaffirmed their recommendation for universal masking in K-12 schools. Since transmission in Stafford is still high, keeping masks universal while we wait for the law to take effect is the logical solution. Many parents only sent their children to school in person this year because everyone would be masked. Many staff members had that same expectation. We're talking about a matter of a few months, perhaps a few weeks. We know this bill is coming and parents who want the opt-out will have it. As representatives in the entire community, however, you can appease citizens on both sides of the issue by aligning any changes to take effect when the law does and not before. With the opt-out decision taken out of your hands, this is what you can control. It is the best of both worlds under the circumstances. You previously voted twice to keep the universal mandate in place until the law said otherwise, and that's all I'm asking for tonight. The sentiment of the Arlington Circuit Court was upending a policy that has been in place since the beginning of the school year would create irreparable harm in these school communities. Please cast your votes in favor of consistency for as long as we may have it. Thank you. As Ms. Fingerholtz come forward, I will call the next names. Catherine Schneider, Paul Mildy, Haley Pershaw, Pamela Famile, Leth, I apologize, or Familetti, I apologize for that, and Annette Dane. My name's Shannon Fingerholtz. I am not gonna be as eloquent as her, but just so happens have kind of sort of the same suggestion. Um, Hospitalizations are trending down, which is great news. The vaccine for preschool age is close to being available for families who would benefit from it. Also great news, most folks can feel the day where we can happily cut these year loops, we're all done. Um, families planned their children's education over this, this last year on the fact that masks would be a requirement within Stafford County for that whole year. Unless other great things happened and the CDC reduced their indoor mask recommendation. Others are just straight pissed. We can figure this out, especially when we remember there are a lot more middle of the road, bleh, middle of the road folks than often the ditch folks. One option is to continue requiring the mask with the existing exceptions, because they are important, as that is what is recommended by the majority of our local medical community. Give a start date of April 15th-ish for the beginning of an only recommendation for the mask. This would be about 38 days, 38 school days. Uh, spring break is in there. This will allow for positive cases to continue to decline, because they are headed that way, um, natural immunity to increase and to allow time for more vaccines for the folks that choose to take them. This will also allow the families, teachers, and staff time to figure out a plan or other option for those who are banking, <coughs> sorry, banking on mask being required and allow schools to fill vacancies or shift staffing, students to virtual, et cetera, as they may need to. Everyone would have a date, everyone would have time to plan, and then families currently choosing virtual instead of mask wearing would be able to get their kids back in school before the end of the year for that final stretch so they can be with their friends. Just a thought. Please consider. Thanks. Hi. 
Catherine Schneider, George Washington District. I'm just asking whenever you guys do decide to get rid of the masks that you put in the policy that our kids are not told they have to wear a mask in order to participate in a sport or any extracurricular activity like was said back in August when you guys teased us and we thought we were going to not have masks. So I just want to make sure our kids are protected from that. Thanks. I think I'm next. Good evening, Madam Chair and school board members and Dr. Taylor. Um, I'm, I'm Paul Milday from the Aquia District. Uh, thank you for the job you do. I know from firsthand experience how much time it takes out of your, out of your life and of course how thankless it can be, uh, especially when you're caught in the middle uh, on, a, on an issue. Um, of course, I'm here to speak about the mask mandate. I've been collecting, with the help of the people behind me, signatures on petitions uh, from folks who are in favor of parental choice on this issue. I'm excited to say that we blew past the 2000 mark a couple of hours ago, and those are mostly Stafford residents, well over 90%, and I'll provide you, if I may, uh, these names and zip codes, and I can give them to you digitally if you would like them. Uh, I'm, it's my intention, of course, to let the people who have signed know how you guys uh, adjudicate this issue at the end of this meeting. Um, by maintaining a mask mandate, you're taking advice from, um, from administrators, and I don't, I don't mean locally, and in some cases, politicians who've been wrong at almost every turn, mask effectiveness, vaccine effectiveness, not recognizing natural immunity. As I'm sure you're aware, uh, these things are changing rapidly, uh, as states right now are, are lifting their masking ma mandates or uh, relaxing them at a dizzying pace. As someone who's been in a position similar to yours, I want to say that just watching the, this, the momentum on this, I, I wouldn't want to be stuck on the wrong side of this issue if I was one of the votes that had been against this issue and has been against this issue. When the science keeps pouring in like it is now about what masking is doing to our kids and what it's done to our kids, um, of course you guys on the local level that, that had the option will be the ones held responsible. So I respectful, respe respectfully ask you to stop this madness now. Stop listening to teachers unions. Um, stop listening to the CDC which takes their talking points from teachers unions. Stop listening to the Democratic or Republican National Committees or, or, or local committees and um, listen to the parents. Um, say no to the politics of fear. There is no connection to the death rate from COVID and kids wearing masks. Let me say that again, there's no connection to the death rate from COVID, whatever that number may actually be, and whether or not kids are wearing masks, and for that, we're not even sure if, it, if it's for, parents, for adults wearing masks. Um, that connection is imaginary, and that connection is the basis on which many have staked their position for forcing masks on our children. So please vote tonight to make masks optional immediately Please don't be a board member who has to wait and be forced by the General Assembly and the governor to, to make you make, give parental choice to these folks. Um, let's get back, you know, let's let kids be kids and let's get back to worrying about turf fields, uh, bus drivers, and um, of course, uh, you're, you're how much funding you're gonna get from the Board of Supervisors in the, in the budget cycle. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm back. Haley Pershaw with uh, my two boys, Padraig, Rodney Thompson, Finn, Colonial Forge. Um, I know y'all are exhausted. I'm exhausted. My kids are exhausted. Everybody's exhausted. I wanted to share with you tonight um, our mask exemption story from the beginning of the school year. Um, I'm just going to read this. Um, we tried unsuccessfully at the beginning of the school year to get a mask exemption for our youngest right here. Um, apparently telling the school and the pediatrician that he couldn't breathe was not enough of a reason um, to get that exemption. So imagine how he felt and how he continues to feel <laughs> knowing that he was dismissed by teachers, administration, and his pediatrician. That's where we are. Um, he missed time in school while we tried to figure it out and find a mask that he could tolerate. So I told the principal that we finally found a mask. But I'm gonna come clean tonight and tell you guys that we never did find that mask. Um, my husband and I, in order to get Patrick back in school, we ordered this mission mask and I have cut out all the liner from the inside of this mask. So the liner is completely gone, it has holes, and this is what my healthy child, so he's not putting anybody at risk, he is healthy. If he's not healthy, I keep him at home. Um, 
but that's not been an issue. Um, this is what he's been wearing to school because it's the only way that he could tolerate anything and my exemption for my child was not granted. Um, so I'm exposing this now and I'm exposing it and I'm telling you guys this because I'm done living this lie. I'm not gonna do it anymore and on Monday, my boys will be given the choice, no matter what happens here tonight, um, whether or not they would like to try to attend school without a mask. Uh, we have been respectful. We have tried not to disrupt the learning environment. Um, we, we honored Dr. Taylor's email, the principal's emails. We, we totally understood that. We got that. So we've been doing this for a couple weeks now. Um, and I know you're tracking how many kids showed up without a mask. That was very disappointing um, because we were trying to be respectful. Um, that number has been low because parents have tried to be patient and trust the legal process as requested. Um, our, our patience has run out. Um, and you can add my boys to that tracking spreadsheet on Monday for showing up without a mask if this is not implemented tonight. Thank you so much. My name is Annette Payne. I, we traded places. I raised two children that went in Stafford schools. Now they're, they're grown and I have grandchildren. I'm here as a hy dental hygienist. I've been a hygienist for 30 years, and I can tell you the effects that um, masks are having on my patients, especially the kids. They're, they're building a lot of tartar that they never have. There's plaque everywhere. They, their mouth is dry. They're getting crust on the, on the side of their mouth. Their tissue's swollen. And that bacteria in the plaque affects their bodies. It's not healthy, and it's not good for them. I've watched, it's, it's just steadily declined in, the time that we've all been wearing masks, myself included. I can't breathe in the mask. I, when I take it off for a second to switch, I feel a breath of air. It's just, um, it's incredible. So I think of these kids in school trying to concentrate. I can't concentrate on my notes. I have to pull it down so I can do my notes. It's, it's incredible. But just what it's doing to the oral health of all my patients, elderly down to the young, is, is it's is not disputable. So the sooner you stop it, the sooner we'll have health, the sooner their mouths will, they have to live with these teeth the rest of their life. That's all they get. So that's all I have to say is just from an oral standpoint, it's, it needs to stop. They need to take them off. Thank you. Madam Chair, before, before you speak, if I can call the next names, please. Mm -hmm. Lucy Chenyavong, Ross Jackson, Ezra Jackson, Grace Jackson, and Lisa Russo. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Pamela Famoletti. I am also a registered dental hygienist in Stafford County and the mother of an eighth grader. I am coming forward this evening because um, for a few different topics, um, one is the oxygen levels. I have found that by working with patients, um, a lot of the population who are forced to wear masks, the children, uh, during the day, they're telling me that they have headaches, they're having um, shortness of breath, they're having a lot of other issues, in addition to what Annette was saying about the oral manifestations. My son is one of them. I notice that whenever, I, I have a, a pulse oximeter at home, and when, He's wearing a mask and I check his oxygen level, it's usually like 96, 97. When we take the mask off, it goes up to about 99. So what does that mean? That means low oxygen in the blood for eight hours a day that these kids are in class with a mask on. Um, a lot of them might have other issues beyond headaches and shortness of breath, but the condition that that can cause is hypoxemia which, as I said, can cause headaches, shortness of breath, but it can also interfere with heart and brain function. So this goes beyond just um, inconveniences or anything that you guys might think um, as far as some of us are fighting for. It's for their health. Um, and to add on to what Annette was saying, um, it does cause xerostemia, um, and that's dry mouth. Dry mouth can lead to increased caries, which are cavities. So I'm getting a lot of kids coming in with a lot of inflammation because they're having to breathe through their mouth instead of through their nose. 
And that can also have effects on the body and the lungs and things like that if you're not breathing through your nose and you're only breathing through your mouth. So um, I think that I would, as a mother, you know, appreciate the opportunity to make the decision for my, for my son if he should be wearing a mask or not. And um, I think that a lot of people are not really looking at the systemic issues that this could be causing them. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Lucy. Um, uh, I want you guys to revote because um, as soon as possible. And remember when you guys said that thir that um, you would only do it for 30 days? Well, it's been two years now. And <laughs> Did you know that satanic cults, human traffickers, and communists have used masks as a weapon to control people throughout time? Um, job, um, your guys' job as elected officials is to protect my rights. My parents' job is to make my medical, educational, and religious upbeings. Um, last night, oh no, a couple nights ago, I heard a man t um, talk about needs versus wants. There is no greater need than protecting our rights. My grandparents escaped from communism to raise my dad and my uncle in a free America. But if we don't protect our constitutional rights, then someday um, soon America will not be free. And if freedom dies in America, there will be no free place to escape to. So two weeks does matter. Please vote um, to make mass optional immediately. Thank you. Hello friends, my name is Ross Jackson. Um, I'd like to talk about the word of the month, respect. I would like to talk about how we all respect each other. I would like to talk about how we respect each other's freedom. I would like to talk how, I don't mind if we disagree, you have the right to do it, I have the right to do what I want to do. That's freedom. And I respect all of your rights. What I don't like is the disrespect that I get from people who think they know better than I do what's best for my children. That is the height of disrespect. So, if at the end of tonight, you choose to vote to maintain a mask mandate, number one, I would like you to explain your disrespect for the law. I would like you to explain that very clearly how you're choosing to disrespect the law and I would like to know why you choose to disrespect the parents of this community. Otherwise, I appreciate your vote in favor of parent choice tonight. And yes, fear is something that a person feels. I feel fear. We demand freedom. Freedom is a we. Freedom is our right, sir. Freedom is for us, not an individual thing. There is no mythical greater good that comes of these masks. And I'm sick of hearing about this mythical greater good that we are all supporting by wearing these masks. Has it stopped COVID yet? We're still here, right? All right. Thank you very much for your time. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. Taylor. My name is Ezra Jackson, and I'm a junior at Colonial Forge High School. What a horrible time that we live in. What a horrible time that we live in where the children need to come to the adults and tell them how you all are infringing on us. What a horrible time that we live in where the voters need to come to the politicians and tell them what the law is. The data I pulled from VDH today was shocking. 18 children have died in Virginia of COVID-19. Not this year, but total. There are roughly 2,401,590 children living in the Commonwealth of Virginia. That means that the percentage of kids aged 0 to 19 who have died 
is 0 0.000075. That's five zeros. Keep in mind, 18 deaths is tragic, but we can't keep living in fear. In fact, moving forward is the only way to get over our fear. We are tired of the fear that you've tried to instill in us. You do not create free thinkers. You create compliers designed to do the same menial task over and over again. When someone does not take what you say at face value, we get sent home. When you run rules contrary to the law, we get sent home. When we get sick and tired of your crap, we get sent home. You are not creating people of diverse thought, which is far superior to people of cultural diversity. You are creating people who will hold a bias against you. You are creating people who are beginning to see through the blinders that you've put on us. If you do not vote for parent choice tonight, I urge parents to support their children refusing to wear a mask. I urge students to have the courage to stand up to the administration. I stood up to the mask mandate. I was not suspended. I was sent home, out of sight, out of mind, to do concurrent learning. I'm tired of being out of sight, out of mind. If you vote in the negative tonight, we will not be out of sight, out of mind. I will be at the school every morning. I will enter the building and I will get kicked out again. Others will join me. Why? Because we're tired of your overreach. We are ready to stand up and are ready to fight back. I've already had students reach out to me. If you guys are watching this, reach out to me. My email is jacksonezram at scps.net. We can fight back. I will be outside the school every morning at 9 a.m., Colonial Forge High School. Anybody who wants to join me can. Members of the board, now is the time to make right with the people because we won't forget. Thank you. Hi, my name is Grace Jackson. I'm a seventh grader at Rodney Thompson, and I'm tired of strangers thinking they can raise me. I don't know a single one of the school board members, and yet you think you know what's best for me. Before now, you didn't even know my name, and you certainly didn't know that I struggle with anxiety every single day because of masks, because I can't understand people, because I feel claustrophobic in a mask, because I can't have a real conversation with anyone without wondering what expressions they had on their faces. My first thought was to go to, to, go to school without a mask. But because of you, I'm scared, terrified of exercising my rights, my parents' rights to raise their own child. I am genuinely scared for our future, our education, and our mental health. My parents have always taught me that everyone has their own role to play. Your role is to pass budgets. My parents' role is to raise me. Your wrongdoing can still be fixed. Please, let my parents have a choice, a choice to do what's best for their own child. Thank you. Madam Chair, before, before Ms. Rusa begins her comments, the next five are Danielle Farley, Jeff Rusa, Megan Daniels, John Paré, and Carla Alsop. Good evening. My name is Lisa Rosa, and I'm going to be short and sweet because I can't do better than, the, than my predecessors. I just want to say to you all, please give choice back to the parents. Thank you. My name is Danielle Farley. I live in the Rock Hill District. Um, I thank you all for holding this meeting and for allowing us to comment. Over the past couple of weeks, you all have been prevented, presented with facts for and against masks by various stakeholders, and that's even including your students. So what we have observed, or at least I have observed, is that teachers claim masks are to preserve their lives and that they know better than parents. SEA has conducted a study that could be potentially biased just because the, we don't know how many of their members actually completed the survey versus teachers who weren't. And on Tuesday, some people had said that outsiders don't belong in this conversation. I'm a taxpayer. I belong in this conversation. Okay? And that is very hurtful to hear that. 
One of the things that you guys are not hearing about is the mental anguish that is being caused. On January 26th, Goldie Hawn wrote in USA Today that we are in, a we are in the midst of a national trauma that could surpass 9-11 and approach the heightened terror of the Cold War years. COVID has changed our children's lives in far more real, tangible ways, social distancing, school closures, daily mask use. Kids are afraid of people, spaces, even the air around them, a level of constant fear not seen in decades. And she also has quoted, in 2021, emergency room visits in the United States for suspected suicide attempts were 51% higher for adolescent girls and 4% higher for adolescent boys. She states that the CDC, the US Surgeon General, and the American Academy of Pediatrics all agree that the state of our children's mental health is now at the level of a national emergency. These masks are causing and contributing to this. As someone who was a survivor of abuse during, from the ages of nine to 13, I didn't have an adult to trust. You're claiming that the teachers are someone that children should be able to go and trust to share if they're being abused. They're being silenced. And I am scared for other kids who are enduring something that I endured that don't have someone to go to. You need to pass a, now for parents to have this option, for children to not have to wear masks, to rebuild the trust not just between you all and the, and the school kids, but or between you all in the community, but also between the school children and their teachers. You are asking for a budget. Our taxpayer dollars pay for that budget. If you want the support, there has to be a two-way street. There has to be a compromise. Thank you. Good evening, board members and Dr. Taylor. My name is Jeff Rosa again and I live in the Hartwood District. Over the past few weeks, you have all heard voices from the Stafford parents, the Stafford residents, and you've heard from students as young as eight years old. There's been consternation over the wearing of masks in schools, both for and both against. To make eye contact with each speaker, listen to their concerns, I commend you for paying attention. I'm not here to regurgitate my prior comments on the quantifiable data defying the logic in wearing masks, nor am I here to discuss peer-reviewed studies describing the adverse reactions from COVID-19 vaccines, such as myocarditis, vasculitis, Bell's palsy, immune-mediated disease, and many other side effects impacting young adolescents. Rather, I want, I want to discuss the concept of taking an oath to serve. I took an oath to serve and defend the Constitution of the United States of America over 30 years ago. The oath was not something taken lightly, and I can personally attest to my fellow warriors and friends who did not make it home that they did not take this oath lightly as well. While we put our lives on the line for the freedoms and liberty of our fellow Americans, we never question this sacred oath to be a part of something bigger than ourselves, serving the greater good. We simply defended the Constitution. We defended freedom. We defended our way of life inclusive of individual rights and liberties. As officers of the Commonwealth, locally elected school boards are bound by an oath to support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Virginia. The oath enables a board member to serve as a privilege bestowed by the people for the people. To understand the synergy between the oath I took and the oath elected an elected official takes, one can simply look to the Bill of Rights. Whether it's in the U.S. Constitution, the Tenth Amendment, where rights are reserved to states and people, not the CDC. Or the Virginia Constitution, Article I, where the people are free and independent, where the people have certain inherent rights, namely the enjoyment of life and liberty. As, a as this board is governed by policy 1105, I find section 9000, code 9501, the needs of parents and family members to assist with the learning of their children, relevant to the topic th today we have at hand. The choice to opt out of masking is a parent's choice, not the CDC's. Our Virginia legislators recently passed SB 739 and House Bill 1272 banning public school systems from imposing mask requirements on students, thus codifying what Governor Youngkin sought to do with Executive Order 2. The board now has the opportunity to apply their oath to serve and both support constitutions by implementing Superintendent Taylor's proposed mask optional policy. I request an immediate vote to adopt Superintendent Taylor's proposal effective immediately, giving parents their inalienable right to care for their children. Thank you.
just going to put on record, I'm glad I'm before that guy, <laughs> but I agree with everything he says. <laughs> Good evening, school board, Madam Chair, Dr. Taylor. My name is Megan Daniels, and I'm from the Hartwood District. I have a daughter in first grade and a four and two year old in preschool. My children are my pride and joy. No one on this earth knows my children better than my husband and I. We have raised and nurtured our children since they were born. No one knows my children's individual health requirements more than we do. And each one of my children's health requirements are different. How can we sit here and think that treating each child with the same mask mandate is doing every child the same justice? I know some of you are mothers. We love our children more than anyone in this world, and that solo, solely should encourage you to do what is right and give the choice back to the parents. Parents are allowed to decide what vaccinations their children get. Why should this be any different? This great country has worked extremely hard to give us our rights. Please don't take away what people have died for. As Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Give our rights back as parents. Thank you. You know, um, when I gave the original version of my speech just two weeks ago, I told you voters were very reactive people. S excuse me, could you give us your name? Oh, sure. John I Hansis. remember you're from AG Wright. I <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I guess I should have added that they would have come out in full force to ensure accountability. Um, it's incredible, both, both the virtual public comments and the comments made by people today, to see such a turnout. You know, holding elected officials accountable is the most important job of a constituent, one of the most difficult for that reason. Dr. Taylor and School Board, good evening. My name is John Hatzis, and I live in the Rock Hill District. And don't worry, I don't plan on coming back to any of these future meetings anytime soon. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Taylor and the administration for their bell, uh, bell schedule report a few days ago. It's a very important issue, and I wanted to say thank you. I really think you noted that the people in CGS are not really a fan of Block Zero, and so hopefully that will not be making its way back next year. Um, but I came here tonight not to talk about the schedule, but because I wanted to note something that my representative, Madam Chairwoman, said a couple weeks ago. Um, you stated that if Virginia Supreme Court didn't strike down Executive Order 2, you know, you'd be the first one in line, I think I'm pretty much quoting there, to end the mask mandate as a constituent and as a future voter, fingers crossed. <laughs> um, please, please honor that promise. It would make me a very happy person. Um, and there was a discussion on this before about court cases and all that. I found it really interesting. Um, the Virginia Supreme Court wasn't the only court that empowered you to go mask optional. You know, the, the Arlington District Judge said school board have the authority to end the mask mandate. You know, the Virginia Senate, led by Democrats, you know, just yesterday backed a bill that is uh, certain to be backed by the Republican House and Republican governor that would require you to go mask optional. So at best, you're required to do it, and of course you have the choice. Um, I, you have the authority to end the mandate, you know, today. Um, and on a final note, I just wanted to say this, you know, some people say that their voice isn't being heard when they're calling for forced masking, and I have to think, you know, when have you not gotten what you want? You know, we've had shutdowns for months on end, you know, we've had forced masking for months on end, we've had canceled events, everything. You know, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, rest of the board, you know, you have the opportunity tonight to the f for the first time in two years, you know, give the people what they want, you know, give the parents what they want, the students what they want, the voters what they want. And all you have to do is one simple thing, which is just keep your promise. You know, you said if the Virginia Supreme Court did not intervene, you would, oh, sorry, uh, end the mandate. And so that is a promise that I hope you'd, uh, that you keep. So thank you, Ms. Sigman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Halstead. Good luck again, Dr. Taylor. Thank you all for your time. Uh, hello, everyone at the board. Welcome, Dr. Taylor. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Pere. I, work, I live in the Hartwood District. Sir, um, could you get closer to oh, the mic? Sure. Thank, thank you. you. So I, uh, I wasn't planning on coming tonight. I just came straight from work. Um, uh, but I just felt compelled to talk about the mass mandate. Um, uh, it's kind of interesting. I've been, I went to a few Colonial Forge basketball games recently. And uh, so I walk in, have my mask on. And it's just funny to see. So I see players come in with a mask. They sit down, no social distancing. Cloth masks, by the way, which absolutely don't work. So I appreciate you wearing an N95. Those at least have some value. Um, they take their masks off. They play one another, breathing on one another. Then they go back to the bench. And they put their useless cloth masks on without social distancing. 
So I guess that's the mask policy. Um, I've been working uh, with active COVID patients since early 2020, so I'm very respectful of uh, really what uh, proper uh, infection control is. Um, I was appalled at that was the mask policy. I mean, you might as well wear those masks on your head. I mean, I, don't, I just didn't understand it one bit. So I just ask you guys, let us parents decide, okay? If a parent is really concerned about their child, let them get vaccinated and wear a proper N95 to school. If you're really serious about infection control, that's what you need to do. But the mask policy is useless. Just give it to the parents. Uh, I thank you all guys all for your time, but give us parental control. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Elsa, if you'll let me call the next five first. Okay, thank you. Casey Durst, Stephanie Mojica, Jody Fagan, Rose Strask, and Francis Baggers. Go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, board. Dr. Taylor, you might know me. I've been here a few times. Um, I just, can we put that guy at the end so that we don't have to go after him? Um, I've, I've heard a couple of things tonight. One is that we're tired. We are all <laughs> tired. I've been here as late as every one of you at all of these meetings as well, which means I've been here a lot this week. So here we are again, and I'm gonna ask you again, please make this parental choice. Give us back our rights. <laughs> My kid's not gonna go to school on Monday again. <laughs> I can't have her home anymore. I love her, she's so sweet, but, he, but she's gotta go. <laughs> Please, immediately, make it happen. I'll wait till Monday. That's as much as I've got, though. And I don't think I speak only for myself. We need this to end. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, and Dr. Taylor. Um, my name is Casey Durst, I'm from the George Washington District, and when I saw the special meeting was called, I honestly thought it was about the uh, idea for uh, beer with the board or shots with the superintendent. Totally missed that memo, but uh, I guess, uh, but you know, that's okay. We'll stick with our tradition. It's kind of short today. What's the most famous creature in the sea? The starfish. Yep. <laughs> uh, Y'all know my position on this topic. Uh, let's make it parents' choice. Uh, and as we know, Richmond will soon codify this into law. Uh, your vote is important tonight. Uh, Senate Bill 1303 does have an expiration date. So I'm no lawyer, but in the absence of this law come next school year, and the lawyer that may continue for Executive Order Number 2, local policies could be in play. So let's end this now. I advocate that this, if not tomorrow, that this goes into effect on Monday. Valentine's Day is still a special day for kids, and being able to do Valentine's Day things at school without being forced to wear a mask would be a very fitting end. And lastly, I challenge myself, and I extend this challenge to my neighbors in this county, regardless of your position, and that is to stay involved, keep advocating, use the energy that we have found to continue to help our kids. Let's not be one-trick ponies and then disappear when this is done. Thank you for your time. Francis Byers, 43 Everglades Lane, Stafford, Virginia. It's time to get to the crux of the masking debate. The students need, to, the, the, the students need, need for unmask, unmask learning have been made clear. Students need to be easily heard and understood in the classroom and be able to hear and understand their teacher in order to learn. But masking impairs this. We are also told that unless N95 masks are worn, and it must be fitted properly on the face, the spread of COVID cannot be arrested. These masks also make breathing very hard, I can attest to that, and do not properly fit young children's faces. If a, if a child cannot breathe well, the child cannot learn. Very importantly, it is the parents who must decide what measures they take to protect their children from contracting COVID. However, they do have the responsibility to keep their sick children or exposed children out of school so here lies the problem. Teachers want protection from unidentified sick students. So like the medical community, they need to execute the professional response to the need and gear up. The likeness of the personal protection uh, response, um, excuse me, equipment, PPE, 
that I'm trying to wear tonight is <laughs> my attempt, poor attempt as it may be, uh, at the professional attire used in the medical community. For self-protection against COVID, add to this five, six foot social distancing, adequate ventilation, you know, it helps, it's a recipe for reducing COVID transmission. Back to the point, this is about the teachers fear and we respect that, but the teachers must, and the teachers must protect themselves without burdening healthy students with educational stifling mask wearing. Indeed, protect yourself. Select the degree to which you wish to desire to go with PPE. Don't, uh, don't don head covering and face shield or goggles and an N95 mask for head protection. Get a mic, get this, get a mic. <laughs> to project your voice to the class as, a, as is done in the classrooms for hearing impaired students. Wear nitro gloves. Put on synthetic uh, uh, isolation gowns and scrub pants and be at peace. Don't fear the students. Do, you, do your job as the good doctors do and wear PE gear, PP gear to the extent that makes you happy. Yes, self <laughs> Self-preservation is a right, and the methods employed are, per are a personal choice. I gear up to go to the grocery store my way, okay? I use a face mask. Sometimes I might wear two masks. Who cares? But I have, a dr I have a drove of these in my arsenal at home. I've never worn one. This is the first time I've ever worn one. <laughs> Get it? Get it, okay? So <laughs> live and let live. Mask up, cover up, glove up and pray for uh, this, this whole shielding from COVID from our God, our divine physician. He's the only one that's gonna save us. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Stephanie Mahiga. I have two children who attend an elementary school in the Garrisonville District. Um, I'm here tonight to continue to support and advocate for masks to be optional and allow parents to make a decision for what is best for their child. My 11-year-old daughter doesn't mind the mask so much because it covers up what little imperfections she believes she has. My nine-year-old son feels the strain and has been reluctant to talk through his mask at times due to other peers not understanding him. Most of you are already aware that my child has significant speech apraxia. A couple of weeks ago, I had brought my son to see his developmental pediatrician. On the summary report, it was listed under diagnosis, childhood apraxia of speech, currently receives SLT, intelligibility about 75% through mask. If I understand this correctly, 25% is affecting his speech due to wearing a mask. However, I believe the percentage could possibly be higher when he is wearing it all day in school and becomes restless throughout the day. I am pleading with you once more to please make mask an optional choice by the parents and students. I recently had an IEP meeting for my son to accommodate his current educational needs as well as to file a form for exemption from wearing a mask. He was approved to wear a plastic shield guard during his speech therapy session and if he is presenting in front of his class. For him to be maskless in his classroom, his um, desk would need to be moved to a back corner and he probably would struggle more with his learning disability. I fear he could possibly withdraw if isolated from his classmates. If he continues to wear a mask, he would not be segregated, but will continue to struggle with speech while wearing it. Neither of these are good solutions, nor does it resolve the issue. I cannot imagine how discouraging this must be for him, for any child who has a speech impairment or any other learning disability. The mask have affected speech language along with their emotional well-being and has contributed to learning loss. Our kids go to school to learn to be successful in life, but all I see is that children are being set up for failure. Please allow parents to choose what is best for their children. What is good for someone else's child doesn't mean that it's good for my child. Our children have been placed on the back burner for too long. It is time to make them a priority. Parents' choice needs to become effective immediately. Thank you. Good evening, school board members and Dr. Taylor. 
My name is Jody Fagan and I'm in the George Washington District. Um, all the schools where masks are optional are reporting that their numbers of COVID are dropping. Why is that? Because there is a lot of happiness. Our bodies are affected by vibrations and frequencies. Everything has a frequency, whether it's a tree, a rock, um, a positive thought, a negative thought, death. Literally everything has a frequency and our bodies are affected by it. Our bodies resonate when healthy at 62, between 62 and 70 megahertz, um, and that's called the line of wellness. When a body's frequency drops below this line of wellness is when we open our bodies up to disease. There's literally a whole lot of science behind this that I can talk about for way more than three minutes. Um, obviously, we don't have enough time. Basically, for the last two years, people have been scared, angry, frustrated, divided, and hateful. Businesses have been closed. Sports have been shut down or altered with restrictions. Kids were not allowed to play at play areas. To be kids um, at school, the, the schools have changed so much that they don't even want to go. A lot of them don't. Um, all of this has affected our bodies and our frequencies. So now with these schools, think about all the happiness that's happening and how it's changing and bringing their frequencies up and bringing them above the line of wellness. Please stop letting fear and fear mongering harm our children. Please let them be children and experience childhood as we, their parents, intended when we brought them into this world. They, have the chi they want, want them to have the childhood that they deserve. They have been, been your political pawns long enough. They have literally lost two years of their short time as children. I have, to, I have an 11 year old and a 15 year old and I know the value and the preciousness of what two years is. We can never give them that time back. They need to see each other smile, see their friends faces, their teachers faces, go to prom, sporting events and just live. I ask you vote tonight and get rid of masks. Give parents the choice. Thank you. Ms. Strask, if you'll hold just one moment, I'll call the next names. Sure. Kelly Tharp, Dr. Robert Harris, Mrs. Downing Bozarth, and Leah Bozarth. That's it. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Mrs. Staroska, Rose Staroska, and I'm from Garrisonville District. So i uh, glad to be here. Thank you for the opportunity and uh, here before all of you, the honorable ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm here because of my plumber. <laughs> I'm speaking for him. So I've got a story about a plumber and somebody who tonight is a very proud teacher. Uh, yesterday I had a plumbing problem and I had a leaky faucet. It was running all over my bathroom. And uh, I uh, called uh, somebody else to repair what uh, a previous plumber did not do correctly. And who showed up but somebody from Stafford County Public Schools and a young student that I had. And he's not young anymore. I mean, he's young compared to me. I'm in my 70s. But he is uh, a very proud new business owner. Yeah, he has a wife and uh, some young children. And uh, he uh, at first didn't recognize me. My hair is a lot grayer than it was 10 years ago. Uh, but that's OK. Uh, uh, he looked at me and he said, I know you. And I said, yeah, it's probably true. I've been through a lot of students. I did 41 years in the United States, four years in London, and the last uh, 15 here in Stafford. So um, he kept looking at me and he says, I remember you. And he says, is Mrs. Lacey still there? And for those of you who are older on the board, you know Mrs. Lacey, she was an excellent history teacher, very hard. And she worked downstairs with a lot of older ones, as myself. And we were hard on the kids, but we had a lot of love. Uh, and we were one of those teachers that really didn't care about that 60% uh, grade we had to get on that huge binder of uh, statistical analysis, uh, Excel sheets, and how we were going to mitigate students who failed and create more tests to do more tests and more reasons and more worksheets that added all to uh, our evaluations. We taught. We cared and looked to the individual child. Uh, why we were, th I was thinking about this, he was very decisively looking at uh, my uh, problem. And he was using a step-by-step -step approach, a decision-making approach. I'm IT, my uh, third degree is in IT, so I've taught them, you know, you analyze the problem, you figure out a, a measurable way, uh, a process of how you can attack it, and then step-by-step -step you figure out what works and doesn't work. It's called critical thinking. Lacey did the same thing in many other teachers in our, uh, our small community downstairs on the bottom floor of my school. 
Um, he finally looked at me just uh, through all that uh, uh, interplay visually, and he said, uh, is Mrs. Lacey still there? He did not realize I retired. And I said, no, she and I had retired a long time ago, and we're not there anymore. Uh, and he said, you know, I went to her and I told her I passed when I graduated. He said, I passed her class and I graduated. I said, why did you do that? He said, because you and her are the only two people that cared about me. He said, you made me realize, in short, that I mattered and that's what a teacher does. You can't transfer knowledge. All you can do is tell children they matter. That's teaching. Hi, I'm Kelly Tharp, and I'm here as a parent and an employee of SCPS. As a parent, I'm saddened by the current masking situation. Our children are being ruled by fear. My child is afraid of taking a stand due to teachers that, are overly, that overly express their opinions. I had a child graduate in 2018 from SCPS. She had a wonderful experience. My child now is not getting the same thing. No socializing at lunchtime, no smiles in the hallways. As an employee, I'm troubled by the obstacles we are placing in the way of learning. Teachers are hard to understand. Facial cues are, not, are part of a big part of communication with uh, nonverbal students. I am just, sorry, having, um, having to wear a mask all day in school is an unneeded burden at this time. You're concerned about teachers and employees leaving if you remove the mask. You should be concerned about teachers and employees leaving if you do not. I can go to multiple private schools in multiple districts here and close by. I have had my mask ripped off my face by students who just want to see my face. They can't tell who's talking, just like I can't tell who of you's talking when you're wearing a mask. Understand why more employees don't come forward. I brought in a uh, problem in our building to the superintendent and was confronted by emails by the principals in my building telling me they were aware I did that. So please, I'm asking you to remove the mask from our children so we can breathe freely. Thank you. Hello, board members, Dr. Taylor. I'm gonna remove my mask. I wanna make sure I'm, I'm coming across clear. My name is Dr. Robert Harris, and unfortunately, I'm a resident of the Hartwood District where the voting majority are supporters of racist, xenophobic, and overall hateful worldviews. And to make sure there's no confusion, I am the same Dr. Harris who's the subject of a poorly written and incoherent opinion piece by Michael Halstead. Yes, I'm the same Point Dr. Harris. Point of order. Excuse okay. Me, sir, can you sp not address individuals? Yes, ma'am. My apologies. Yes, I'm the same Dr. Harris who was falsely accused of being a stalker via social media, according to VA Code 18.2-60.3. And yes, I'm the same Dr. Harris who has stated on multiple occasions that racist, xenophobic, and hateful individuals could not bully into silence. First, I want to thank the five board members for using common sense by keeping the mask mandate in place. As a retired military policeman, I have investigated a plethora of parents, uh, of parents for child abuse during my 22 years of service. And regrettably, child abuse by parents is not an isolated phenomenon. And the one thing those parents had in common that they knew was, was best for their kids. For example, here are two recent reports of parents not acting in their kids' best interest, regardless of their intentions. In Arizona, parents were sentenced for driving to flood waters because their irresponsible action resulted in the death of three, three of their children. In West Virginia, parents of a child who died in a house fire were charged with neglect because their irresponsible action resulted in their child's death. In addition, Virginia has approximately 5,000 kids in the foster care program, and the vast majority of those children were removed from their parents' home because the parents did not have the kids' best interests at heart. I highlighted those things to illustrate that sometimes the government must go against parents' wishes to protect their kids. Excuse me, sir. I mean, yes, ma'am. We'll, we'll add to your time. We're not here to hear from the audiences this time. You'll have your opportunity to come forward. Please respect the speaker and this board and do not respond during someone's comments. Thank you. 
and we'll go ahead and add that to you. Thank point. you, ma'am. I highlighted those two things, those things to illustrate that sometimes the government must go against parents' wishes to protect their kids, even from the parents themselves. And the five of you did just that when you voted to maintain the mask mandate and when you voted down the poorly crafted amendment introduced and supported by the board. Now the state Supreme Court has dismissed the lawsuit by Chesapeake parents. The other side are claiming that this, that decision means EO2 is valid and of course that it's not accurate. Per the Supreme Court, I quote, we offer no opinion on the legality of EO2 or any other issue pertaining to petitioner's claim. You all will be, soon you all will be pressured and probably threatened by anti-masking group to, resent, to rescind the masking mandate. I implore you all to continue to stand in the gap for our most vulnerable population and the school staff tasked to educate them. And with that said, legally, nothing has changed outside of a judge ruling that EO2 did not support supplant a law from the last time you all voted to maintain the mask mandate. SB 1303 is still the law of the land. Sir, your time is up. Did you give me my time back, yes, ma'am? Oh, I'm sorry, did you not add I, that? I paused it when the, during the interruption. Yeah. It, it, it was paused. Okay then, thank you. Y'all have you. a good evening. Good evening. My name is uh, Courtney Downing Bozarth. I've been here before, as you guys know. Uh, my child, Willa, over there is a brain cancer survivor. I spoke on her behalf last, last time, and this time I just want to say some words about my kindergartner here, Leia. Um, she's been suffering with fungus growing in her ear from a wet mask because she's a mouth breather and drools and is, gets excited, as you guys can see. And she's had to have it. Um, scraped out of her ear three times now, just this week. She's been out of school all week. Um, her, we're waiting on an exemption. Her principal over at Annie Moncure, Mr. Arachi, has been amazing. Um, unfortunately, just like Will has been waiting on an exemption, we can't get exemptions. So as you know, that whole debacle. But um, I just want to say, please uh, give us parents our choice. And Leia would like to talk. Go ahead, Leia. Say what you want to say. Um. Just say what you feel. Okay. You want to say about your I, I like going to school and and having me wear these masks make me make me not be able to go to school. I love school. So so please please let me do do parents choice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Chair, that concludes the list of people who signed up before the meeting. All right, there, there were several people who indicated they wanted to speak. Uh, if you would come forward first, and then anyone else who wants to speak, please line up on either side. And um, Madam Clerk, how is our time? We have an hour and 25 minutes, 24 okay. minutes. All right, so we have, we have time for everyone, hopefully. And if you could give us your name when you um, and sign in. speak and when you finish, you can sign in. He's left, Thank he you. Left, he left in. She has a sign-in sheet? Right uh, it, it's right there. Okay. Good evening. My name is Ethan Gusick. My son is at uh, kindergarten at Winding Creek Elementary. I would like to say um, before this past year ago, he was at pre uh, preschool at a private institution that did not require him to wear a mask. Since age two, he's been diagnosed with a delayed speech. I know a couple other parents here have had expressed similar concerns. He was uh, thriving at that preschool without a mask. Since this past year has happened, he's noticeably had a decrease in his speech, his writing, his reading, and all those cognitive abilities. He's supposed to go to school to flourish and learn, not be held back. He is at an extreme detriment by attending school not growing. He's, he's worse off attending school this past year. And he's still smart. He does all his homework in school and he's learning at home more than he is at school. So I just want to put that out there that it's, something's kind of backwards there that he's better off not attending school, that his um, speech has been delayed, his reading has been delayed, his writing has been delayed worse than attending school. So I just want to let you take that in consideration when you want to remove or 
uh, key, uh, give parents the right to decide what's best for their students because also uh, in July when we did a parent orientation we that's the first thing we it listed as a concern was hey he has a speech issue please take that into consideration just now last month we finally heard back from the speech department about his their concerns with his speech it took that it took about eight months to finally get an initial screening done when we were told that would be happening right away now we're told that the further screen is not going to be complete until mid to late April then we can finally request a 405 exemption it shouldn't take the entire school year to get an exemption made it the year is over the damage has been done so I ask that you please give myself and my wife the opportunity to decide what's best for my son and his development. Thank you. My name is Katie Pender. I am from the Aquia District. I'm reading from someone who was not able to be here this evening. Good evening, my name is Sherry Steele and I'm here in support of parental choice on the subject of masks. Masks have been proven to be ineffective and have caused more harm than good to children. We've all seen the data, you've seen the data, yet here we still are, fighting for our parental choice and to simply follow the executive order put forth by our newly elected Governor Yunkin, chosen by the people. You have also been chosen by the people, yet you still do not hear us. Tonight it is time to listen. I wear many hats in life, a nanny of a Stafford County student, a grandmother to two Stafford County students, and a substitute in Stafford County. I will share with you what I see in the classrooms. First, let me say to the schools and classes that I have subbed in are filled with amazing teachers, administrators, and support staff. They have been put in a very difficult position to enforce this ridiculous rule that you have chosen to illegally enforce. Not only are they stressed out, the students are stressed out. One of the faces of some of these children you see, oh, sorry, on the faces of some of these children you see, filthy masks, wet masks, masks worn incorrectly, masks that are too small, masks that are so big they nearly cover their eyes, children sucking their masks inside their mouths. They constantly touch their masks and then touch everything around them. The children that wear glasses struggle with them fogging up all day. I've seen masks on the playground, parking lot, and on the floor. When teaching, it is extremely difficult to hear the students, and it is just as hard for them to hear me. When their teacher, the one who they are familiar with, has to take a day off, a stranger with a mask shows up. They never, see, they never even see my face or I theirs. I wouldn't recognize them at the grocery store if I ran into them and their family. I used to enjoy seeing the kids around town, running into them here or there. Now I wouldn't even know who they were. I also never see the faces of the office staff and the administrators of any or, the, or any of the other teachers in the building. I wouldn't recognize them if I were to run into them either. Two of my grandchildren attend Stafford County Schools. They have both cut holes in their masks. When I questioned them, their reply was, so I could breathe. This is unacceptable and one of the saddest things I think I have ever seen. So they could breathe? Why are we even having this conversation? It is time to put an end to this, not only for the students, but for all those teachers that want the choice and are afraid to speak up. Imagine a world without smiles. That's the world these kids are living in at school. This is not normal, and it must come to an end. And let me add, my own son has decided that he would rather stay home because he showed up to school with a ma without a mask yesterday, and instead of being allowed to stay in school, he was sent home. This is wrong. He needs to be in school. Our kids need to be in school. They need to be free. Madam Chair, would, would you ask the lady to come back and sign in? Oh, I'm sorry. Where, where, did she leave? Oh, there she is. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Go ahead. Hi, my name is um, Terry Runforth and I'm a school bus driver. I've been driving for 35 years and only 11 in Stafford because I came from Fairfax. Anyways, um, I got COVID. I did the whole thing. I put the mask on every day on that bus. I did it in Walmart. I did it in everywhere. And I sprayed my bus. I disinfected my bus. I made sure the kids had the hand sanitizer. I got COVID and almost died. I was in the hospital for two weeks 
and didn't know if I was ever going to lay eyes on my kids again. So do I think these work? I, I'm sorry, but I don't think they work. But I'm told to do it as my boss ex tells me that I have to wear them. So if you're going to take them off the kids in the classrooms, take them off the bus too. We would 100% appreciate that. All the drivers do not want them. It is very distracting. And another thing is, too, that we are so sick and tired of arguing with these kids about these masks. It is just out of control. It really is. And I do want to say, too, that if it stays on the bus and these parents get the choice to take them off in school, please tell your children, do not come on the bus acting all sassy and saying, well, my mom said, no, the bus rules are, okay? I mean, that's just all I'm asking. It's just, it's hard out there anyways with the behavior of these kids these days, and then you want to add this on top of it. It's just too much for me. <laughs> Thank y'all. <laughs> Hello, I hope you all are doing well. My name is Lorelai Johnson and I'm an eighth grade student. I wanted to speak tonight to share my thoughts on masking in school. Did you know I have friends at school? I have never seen their face. Crazy, right? Masks are taking away things I thought I would never lose. Are we just supposed to never see people smile again? Seeing people smile is really important for mental health. I miss seeing my friends and my teachers' smiles. My parents always told me to be cautious with texting because words do not express human emotion. Wearing a mask all day makes it difficult to read expressions on people's faces. Is my friend being sarcastic with a smile or angry at me? I don't know. I'm asking you for the freedom of choice. If a teacher or a child wants to wear a mask, I respect their decision. I want to share some of the experiences I witness at school. I witness students and teachers touching their mask over and over with dirty hands to speak, get a drink, or a breath of fresh air. I witness people not wearing masks properly around their chin or not over their nose. Teachers constantly reminding students to repeatedly to wear the mask properly, properly. I feel bad for my teachers. They have a hard job and now they are forced to be mask police to enforce the rules and pol policies they didn't make. I know many in my school feel lonely, depressed, sad, and hopeless. This pandemic, the lockdowns, stay-at-home orders, the, and masks have taken a toll on me and my classmates. I want to see them. I want to see my f the faces again. I want to see. I want them to see my face again. I want them to see my smile when they feel lonely. I want them to know they are loved and valued. I want to end tonight with a quote from Mother Teresa that I felt was fit for what I'm saying tonight. The greatest decease in the West today is not TB or leprosy. <clears throat> it's being unwanted, unloved and uncared for. We can cure physical diseases with medicine, but the only cure for loneliness, despair, and hopelessness is love. Thank you for your time, and I hope you take this into consideration. My name is Rachel Johnson from the Rock Hill District. I'm sure you guys know that. Um, I was going to talk about the suicide study the CDC released. I thought that was sad, but someone already touched on it. I was going to talk about the value of smiling and seeing people smile and how it actually can affect your immunity because it's fact. Um, all these things that people have mostly talked on tonight. But one of the things that keeps being said over and over is the CDC says they're not a governing body. They're not. And I'm tired of being told that we are supposed to listen to these bureaucratic appointed and, and ran for positioned people. In this country, the, the government and these organizations get it wrong. The NIH studies where they gave HIV medications to orphans in New York City. Ask David Koresh, go to Ruby Ridge, look at the Tuskegee experiment, slavery, the internment camps, the Patriot Act, the Alien and Sedition Act. We can go on and on and on. The government is just a group of flawed people. There's money to be made, there's ulterior motives, there's a million things that we won't understand for a hundred years. The science is clearly showing. Even the study in Arizona that did show a slight decreased risk has been torn to pieces because they didn't hold any other metrics 
constant. They didn't look at the school that required masks, also had 80% vaccine, where the one that didn't only had 40. They didn't look at the ventilation systems in the school. They didn't look at any of that. So it was completely flawed. Most studies are showing at best a 10 to 30% decrease among properly masked individuals. Go into these schools, watch these kids take their masks off for lunch in their classroom, watch them go to the cafeteria and eat next to each other with no masks on for 20 minutes, watch them suck on them, watch them wear them on their wrists on the playground and rub them all over the play equipment and then put it back on their face. It's not working. It's burdening our kids, it's burdening their mental health and these children aren't dying. And I understand immune compromised people, I do. For the most part, they're eligible for vaccines. My husband has an autoimmune disease, a bad one. One where he will live 15 years less than he should. It's that bad. He got vaccinated, he got vaccinated again and again, and he's gonna do what he can. And if he chooses to wear an N95, I will let him wear it. I'll mock him a little, but I'll let him wear it. <laughs> but it is no one else's job to protect the immune compromise. No one was wearing a mask during flu season for these kids, and more of these kids died from the regular flu than COVID. This has to stop. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sue Sweet. I'm a kindergarten teacher at Stafford Elementary School. Um, I don't honestly care what you decide about masks. I'll be absolutely honest with you. Um, my questions are these, because coming from a teacher standpoint, I will say I also get very emotional because I am very, very, I am very, very, um, I can't think of the word right now, but I'm very much a committed teacher, okay? So I'm gonna say that. My questions are these. If you say masks are optional, can parents say they don't want their masked children sitting next to unmasked children? How do we know which parents do not want their kids sitting next to unmasked children or masked children? Are we supposed to survey our parents to find that information out? Can we seed our classes by masked and unmasked children, or is that considered discrimination? Do all kids have to be seated six feet apart if they are unmasked? If so, I need three more six-foot tables in my classroom. How are they going to fit in my classroom? I don't know if any of these things are the thing. I'm sorry. I don't know if the they are. I don't know if you guys are thinking about these things, and I'm sure the parents that want the mask lifted are not thinking about these things. And I'm not belittling them. Please let me speak. I am not belittling them, but these things have to be thought about. We can't just flip on a dime and make these changes. I've been at my classroom until just before I came here at 7 o'clock. There are so many of us that are there every day, 12 hours, and we're, we're tired. I'm tired. I'm exhausted right now. It seems a little bit ridiculous. Okay, so this is the other thing I wanted to say. Also. If staff want to go maskless, why can't they? If kids can go maskless in my classroom, I have no idea how many kids are vaccinated or not vaccinated because I've been told we're not, or we've been told, we're not allowed to ask that information because it's a HIPAA violation, though I've been told that is also not true. Um, it seems a little bit ridiculous that if staff want to go without masks, that they are unable to. Um, I'm personally vaccinated and boosted and I would love to go maskless because I am teaching kindergartners how to say sounds. And they can't hear through this. Um, my last question would be, I've been told that if parents are choosing not to have their children attend because they're I mean, compromised or anything else like that, what is the situation for teachers? Are we putting that many more people and that many more students in concurrent? Currently, my owl is broken. I have no owl to teach my concurrent children. So I'm teaching from a little desk camera on top of my, my, um, my computer. Not the best of circumstances, and I'm not the only one in my school, and I've been told they cannot be replaced because they're $1,000 a camera. Thank you for your consideration. Feel free to come and visit me. Kindergarten, room Thank nine you. at Stafford Elementary School. Thank you. My name is Kate Lewins. I am a part of the Stafford County District at Margaret Brant Elementary School. I am here to talk about masks. They do not protect anybody from COVID. I know several people who agree. 
I've had headaches that masks have caused. It's getting harder to breathe and socially interact with friends. It can also be hard to hear our teachers. Some activities that we do in indoor PE are terrible with masks. We can barely breathe and it's not fun. Our teachers have to constantly remind people in our class to put your mask on and it's getting out of hand. We have to wear masks on our face for six hours or more a day. It's really hard and I think you should consider parental opt-out. Think about your decision for the kids. Thank you. and I am eight years old in third grade and I haven't been to school for two weeks because of this because of mask. I like school and I want to go back but my mom gave me the choice to either wear a mask or not and I they don't really help me at all so I like to not to wear a mask and I want to go back to school so Thank you for my time. <laughs> Hi, <clears throat> my name is Laura Brewer and I'm a Stafford County School Bus Driver. And to follow after what my colleague said, I would just like to remind everybody that it is still a federal mandate that we as drivers and students have to wear a mask on the bus and the job is difficult as it is today please don't make it any more difficult I have no choice so your child has no choice and I would just appreciate the grace and courtesy that you give us by not causing a hard time by telling your child they don't have to so thank you Good evening, my name is Jim Riuta. I live in the Quiet District. I have a son that is a junior now and started in kindergarten with Miss Sweet that just spoke before you a few moments ago. So I feel very fortunate that Stafford County has some wonderful teachers and he's well on his way to uh, college here, hopefully in another year. So I feel very fortunate that he's grown up here in Stafford. The schools have done a wonderful job and at this, especially under the circumstances in the last few years. And so today I'm speaking, uh, I, I had not intended to speak to you, and so I, I don't have prepared remarks, and nor do I think I need to, because I've seen, or I've heard this evening, many, many reasons why we should not be wearing masks or forcing our children to wear masks in school or on the school buses. There's, uh, from what the background that I've done, there's no law that states that they have to. The, ma the uh, rules and the laws that were quoted by the school board say that it's your job to help protect the children. While I appreciate you wanting to protect the children, I'm sure your heart's in the right place, but you're completely wrong. The idea is that you know better and that you should be making the decision for all of our children is wrong. You represent the constituents. The uh, constituents have been speaking loudly and clearly that they want the choice to wear or not wear a mask. So I ask you to honor their wishes. I certainly uh, value, well, probably not really, but I'll state that I value your opinion, but at the end of the day, your opinion is really just one and you're not there to voice your opinion, 
you're there to represent your individual districts. So while I appreciate the job that you're doing, I want to make it perfectly clear that the mandate should be, should be rescinded and the choice should be up to the individual parent as to whether they wish to have their child wear a mask or not. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, board, chairman. Nice to meet you, Dr. Taylor. Um, so I'm Lawrence Batiste. I come from uh, Rock Hill, or I'm sorry, the Harwood District. I used to live in the Rock Hill District. I used to hail from there for several years, and I'm sorry that, but I definitely hail from the Hartwood District now. Um, mass mandates are coming to an end across the nation. It's time to get on that train. We are not requesting an end to masks just for you to begin to respect parents' rights. There's a, uh, however, I'll just thank you for this. There's a silver lining to this. I do want to thank you as this situation has provided me the opportunity to have a better visibility on what my children are learning in school. Now, after the past several weeks, my children were denied in-person learning. We kept them home. I had a little eye on what was going on. I was not comfortable with some of the content that was there. So now, my family is looking to divorce ourselves from government schools. Private schools are expensive, but for the sake of our children's future, we can't afford not to send them. As a parent, I shouldn't be facing that dilemma. Families are your customers, and when businesses disregard a patron's um, uh, uh, their patrons, they go out of business. You ask families to walk across the street, advocate for your business, but right now you're writing about two out of seven stars. <laughs> Quit dismissing our rights and allow parents to focus the, this kind of energy to support you. We understand your fiscal issues and we want to help you. We absolutely want the best schools, the best teachers, and them to receive the compensation that's in line with our neighboring counties. Oh, sorry, here. Work with us, quit denying parents their rights. Respect that, if you respect that, at least I will work with you. It's time to align our county with the direction the world is going. Thank you for your time. Mr. <laughs> Melody Moore, I'm part of Rock Hill District. Uh, I get terrible headaches after wearing a mask for even less than five minutes, and I'm very disappointed in myself for subjecting my children to these masks for hour after hour at school each day. We put up with this because we truly believe that we were blessed to be in Stafford County, and even more so to be districted into Margaret Brent. We believe that we had leaders and representatives who would fight for our children, uh, for the children of this county, or at the very least, allow us parents to fight for our own children. We have quietly endured the past two years of subpar education and ridiculous mandates, and shame on us for that, but enough is enough. I no longer accept that I am to wait for my parental rights to be handed back to me. Regardless of your vote tonight, you can add three more children to the number of kids that will be arriving to Margaret Brent next week, ready to breathe in, uninhibited, all of the odors that elementary schools have to offer. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sophia Halstead. I live in Hartwood, and um, she's got notes. <laughs> I can't stand in line with my friends. I have to be in the front. Sometimes I can't s st play with my friends. So, p so please vote parental choice. Thank you for your time. My name is Juliet Schweider, and I am in the Aquia District. So my friend Anne Marie has one leg. God bless her. She lives in Barbados and is so beloved that the president decided that all pants should only have one leg. Now 99.5% of the people on Barbados have two legs. But President Bundy had all the pants made and imported with only one leg. 
a little crazy. That's what we're doing here in Stafford County. You, the board, needs to do away with, do what's best for the 30,000 students and teachers. Give parents and teachers a choice to wear a mask or not. If I want to buy pants with one leg, that should be my choice, but not the only option. I urge you not to wait. Some argue that we need to get to zero transmission before we can take masks off. It's the only way we'll be safe. But can we ever get to zero? Let's look at zero. Zero teen car accidents? I uh, doubt it. Zero teen pregnancies? We could only wish. Zero drugs on school campuses? <laughs> I don't know if you walked anywhere lately. Zero cheating in school? Those are crack pipe dreams, not the realities of society. <laughs> the argument the argument is made that without masks, schools will shut down. But will they? Kids don't wear masks to practice and after games they're not wearing them, or they wear them as chin diapers. Students are hanging out in parking lots before school socializing. They don't go in because they have to wear masks. Basketball stadiums across the country are full. Fans are shoulder to shoulder. For a year in Stafford County, we've been playing football, basketball, and wrestling. Wrestling! Have you seen a wrestling match? They're practically licking each other. <laughs> Sweaty bodies all over each other, okay? But there's no wholesale closing of schools. I actually asked our AD today about breakouts in schools and with wrestling. Uh, really low. We still have schools. Two years we've been wrestling, okay? The real deal is that it's difficult to understand people in mass. That lady who just spoke, what I heard was this. This is what I heard, and this is what I told them I heard in the and we don't have masks on, okay? It's ridiculous. It's distracting, as you hear students telling people, their teachers are so busy asking them to put their mask up, they barely have time to teach, okay? Let's take that out. We're masking children, and we're preventing them from learning. It's time to move on. Give parents, students, and teachers a choice. Thank you. Good evening, board. Dr. Taylor. My name is Corey Schwindemann, and I'm a member of the Aquai District. I didn't plan on speaking tonight, and there's nothing that I can say that, you know, hasn't already been said. But one thing that I've noticed in my short time here in Stafford of seven years is that a lot of us move to Stafford for one reason, because it's a special place. It's a place that isn't dictated and ran by the counties in Northern Virginia. We have a golden opportunity here to make Stafford Stafford. Vote down the mass mandate. I advocate for the teachers. They should also have a choice as well. I didn't hear enough of that tonight, but I'm sure everybody in this room thinks that teachers should also have a choice. Please listen to your constituents and be reminded that elections have consequences. Thank you. Corey. Good evening, board. My name is Lindsay Daigle, and I am a proud homeowner in the Hartwood District. Thank you to our representative. Um, I didn't plan to speak tonight. Honestly, I don't have anything prepared, but I was sitting here in the audience listening to all of the comments of this evening, and my mind went back to not this previous Tuesday meeting, but the Tuesday before. That cute little blonde one, the very first little girl that got up and talked, that's my little girl. And if my little girl can get up in front of you and speak as eloquently as she did, then I thought, well, without anything prepared, Mama can probably give it a go. I'd like to remind you guys of a few things. During your deliberations, after everybody spoke last time, some of the things I heard that I really wanted to point out the falsehood of that line of thinking, thinking first and foremost, you guys were talking about, well, it was only 20 kids that didn't show up. I'd like to remind you that not only did your superintendent beg of us to cooperate, to be peaceful, and to stand in line, as did our governor. We were doing what we were asked to do. Do we need to keep our kids out to prove a point? Because we can do that. Yeah. Second point, you guys commented about some sort of survey amongst teachers and we're saying 70 something percent, but it turns out that the percentage of teachers that actually responded 
was significantly lower and therefore it wasn't actually 78% of teachers, it was 78% of the people that responded to the survey and so there's zero clarity there on what you guys actually meant. <laughs> Lastly, we are not asking for you guys to force kids not to wear a mask. We're not. Trust me, please understand, I just said goodbye to my dad December 10th, 2021. It's 7.47 in the morning. I watched that man take his last breath in my house. I held his hand as he died. A victim of the COVID vaccine, might I add. I spent my entire year of 2020 and 21 doing everything I possibly could to protect my immunocompromised father, a man that had just had an organ transplant in February. Every strategy we did, even keeping our kids home the entire year, the year before, even when you guys went back, my kiddos didn't because we had to keep Pop-Pop safe. Families with immunocompromised people have that opportunity. We have that choice. I had to make that choice. But it's time for you to put the power back with the parents where it belongs. Give us the opportunity to do what's best for our family because everybody has a choice then, not just one group or the other. I've been on both sides, I promise you. I have so much compassion for those that are at risk. I do. But you've got to give it back to us. We have to be able to stand up for our kids because not one of you, nobody in that school, nobody behind me knows Savannah, knows McKenna, knows Jackson like I do. You don't. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Matt Strickland, and I own a restaurant in Fredericksburg called Gore Melts. And uh, thank you. Sorry, and at the beginning, I, uh, I realized pretty quickly that this was all about control, so I didn't follow these mandates at my restaurant. And subsequently, the former governor and the former attorney general, they sued me. They, uh, they took me to court, and they tried to kill my business. They tried to shut me down. They tried to ruin my livelihood, and the opposite happened. I won, and I proved that these mandates were unconstitutional. Now, why more people didn't stand up and fight back after that verdict, I'm not sure. But what's hilarious to me is that the same people that were screaming, I need to be put in jail for not following an, an executive order, are the same people screaming not to follow an executive order now. Yeah. So I wanna, I, wanna ask, I wanna ask the citizens that are here tonight to pay attention. Pay attention to who votes to mask your children tonight and make sure that person is never again an elected official. And I also want to tell you guys that by any means necessary, regardless of what happens tonight, we need to stand up and stand together and take back our schools, take back our state, and take back our country. I'm ready if you are, baby. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the board? My name is Jana Rogocia and I go to the SES uh, schools, Stafford Elementary, and um, at snack time I have to take down my mask and, and then put it take a bite and then put it back on and I don't think that's right and uh, recess I run out of air and I can't breathe. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nathaniel Wingochia. I go to um, SMS Spartans, so I go Spartans. I'm in seventh grade, and um, my opinion on the mask, I hate them. You shouldn't wear them. What I do is because I can't breathe because of them, I just leave it under my nose until some teacher to, that tells me to put it back up. And after uh, they tell me that, I just take it down because I just can't breathe in these face coverings. 
they um in gym we have to wear them in the building when we're inside and um you just sweat because you're running around and uh it's very difficult to breathe when you're sweating running around and doing hard workouts in gym thank you Good evening, my name is Flavius Lingocha. Uh, good to see everyone here in the board, esteemed members. Um, I'm in support of parents' choice, obviously. Thank you for those who are against parents' choice um, for giving us the opportunity to come out and it's good to see differences of opinion. I'm support of the bell schedule, excellent work on that. I was at school when I was in high school, 715, you gotta be in high school. And Look what became of us. We have jobs, we have families, careers. Perfectly fine. It's going to be all right, even for the elementary school kids for going at 9:30. Um, just one thing I want to say. I'm a man of prayer. God is first. Family, then country. So real quick, I just want to pray. Almighty God, thank you for saving. Thank you for any blessings. I thank you for the board here. I thank you for all the parents who came out. Lord, give the board wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, Lord. We serve a God of freedom. We serve a God who gives us free will, gives us choice, Father God. I pray the decision that they make tonight may glorify you forever. I pray all these seeds in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Like many people, I did not plan to speak tonight, but I have one thing to say. If you don't make it parents' choice, I'm gonna start following it as those footsteps and I'm walking to school without a mask. If they kick me out, they kick me out. But I can't keep doing this. And I will be respectful, but I can't. Thank you for your time. What's your name? Good evening. Uh, when people said they didn't intend to speak tonight, literally I didn't. At 7.40, I was in sweatpants. Ms. Sigman, thank you for saying anyone who shows up, you want to hear him speak. So I actually got dressed and came here, um, <laughs> literally. So I just wanted to point out, I'm not going to, uh, the ridiculousness of all this. Oh, first, Miss Sweet is an amazing teacher. Listen to what she says. She's wonderful. She, both my kids, one is in there now, one was in there last year, both Stafford, uh, Stafford Elementary. So here's the ridiculousness. My son's birthday party a few weeks ago. All the kids in the class, all here, we're in a room partying hard. We get a call at 9.30 at night on a Sunday that my little girl was exposed sometime last week because she ate lunch near someone that was in her class that came down with COVID. So she's got to stay home now for 10 days. So I'm a responsible parent. I call the doctors. They say, whoa, 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 Are, does she show symptoms? No, she does not. OK, well, if five days she doesn't show symptoms, you're good to go. Well, don't I need to come get her tested? They said, no, we don't test anymore if they don't show symptoms. OK, well, I got to get a test. So we're going to make her stay out of school longer. And so we end up getting one of these ridiculous at-home tests, which I found are completely unreliable from multiple people in this community having false positive and false negatives. But then, so I said the next logical thing. My little girl has been all over my son and in this party, and they say, uh, Saturday nights shared the same bed and fell asleep together. So what do I do with him? Oh, he's fine. Bring him in. Oh, well, that's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> so, and, ooh, minute 27. Okay, so, and I've watched a new art form created in the last year and a half that has been amazing to me. The art form of how to wear a mask while not wearing a mask. <laughs> We're going to see how big a mask we can get, how ill-fitting a mask we can get. We're going to get a mask, and we'll just keep pulling it down. Or I have noticed people at work, they always have a cup of water. And whenever anyone looks at it, I'll just take a drink. Because if you have a drink, you don't have to have your mask on. So we've come up with this new thing. And I know it's my kids the same way. Not to mention, both my kids love school. They're smart kids. I'm very proud of them. My kids hate the masks. I get the masks. But they hate them. They started to make excuses on why they should go virtual now because they think it's a legitimate option to stay home and stare at a computer screen. There was a study long ago, and God help me, I don't know the actual uh, 
citation, but it said, what was the difference between these super smart kids in like Korea who uh, could do math and all that? And they said the socialization in the United States is what set us apart because our kids had these social skills that some of the other countries didn't. We're losing some of those skills. Our kids may be great at, at the little computer stuff, but they're going to get there anyway. Apparently some of the games are not games, it's coding I'm finding out. But it, it, it's, it's time to be done. Everyone's doing everything they can to get them off anyway. I mean, the school nurse told me, said, yeah, your little girl's been exposed. I said, yeah, so was I three times today. I gassed up, I went to Walmart, went to Best Buy. <laughs> it happens all the time. It's time to move on. Thank you. All right. If no one else wishes to address the board, I don't see anyone coming forward. I have one more. Is there anyone else that wishes to address the board? I'd ask you to come forward now. All right, we'll hear from you, sir, and then we'll close the comments if there's no one else standing to come down. Hello, my name is Brandon Warner. Um, I spoke a couple of days ago. Uh, have you ever noticed that the science keeps changing to what everyone was saying in August? Just throwing that out there. So we had a, uh, a jolly man here earlier, brought some examples from Arizona and West Virginia that, uh, you know, that's bad parenting. Personally, I don't know, well, one, Arizona, Stafford, you know, tomato, tomato, I guess. But I would personally put the record of parents up, up against the record of the government any day, day of the week, twice on Sunday. Um, apparently, we wanted all the immunocompromised kids to die before 2020, we, we didn't care. Um, or maybe it's just politically convenient to yank at the heartstrings. Um, there are mitigation strategies that Stafford has. We should try to implement those if anyone's afraid. Um, I'm curious to see what I hear tonight as far as the board members, because usually it's, uh, you know, can't vote because it's not legal or have to wait until the case counts come down or there's a new variant and we're all going to die again. <laughs> or my personal favorite is, you know what, I'm just not comfortable. Maybe tonight you'll be comfortable. You've been given cover. I, I don't understand why, unless you really don't want to for a political reason. Um, Dr. Taylor has said, hey, I got the strategy you, you can take if you want. I would like to do that. Um, the people who run for re-election, I'm curious to see what the campaign slogan is, is going to be, you know, like, vote for me, I will be your coward or something, you know, like, just, I'm not going to vote for those people. Um, on this board, I need lions, not lambs, and I don't need communist lambs. Um, so apparently all these Democrat controlled states now looked at the midterm elections and said, ooh, 15%, that's uh, probably not going to get as many votes. So, you know, everyone's opening up and, you know, the science has changed apparently. Even that crazy lady on CNN who said, you know, I think we need to take the kids away from parents who don't vaccinate, all of a sudden says, you know what, natural immunity is a thing and we should, uh, you know, masking wasn't meant to be forever. We're going to be okay, guys. All right, you may not like it. End of the day, we're gonna be okay. Thanks for your time. All right, I see no one else wishes to address the board. We'll close the public comments. And before we start our action items, we're gonna take a 10 minute break. Okay, now, now I would ask that you remain on good behavior. We have teachers in the room and, and allow us to have this discussion. Please, thank you. Do we have a motion on the action item 4.01, COVID-19 mitigation strategies, masking? Ms. Randall. Madam Chair, I move that the school board rescind the SCPS universal mask mandate for students, staff, and visitors 
as established on January 20, 2022, on the grounds that universal masking for students, staff, and visitors is no longer practicable in Stafford County Public Schools. The effective date of the rescinded universal mask mandate will be Tuesday, February 22, 2022. Wearing masks and face coverings will continue to be allowed for students, staff, and visitor use. Stafford County Public Schools will continue to follow guidelines from the CDC and the VDH, which include, but are not limited to, the recommendation of wearing well-fitting masks or face coverings to stop the spread of COVID-19. Universal masking requirements for employees are currently required, but will be lifted when allowed by VOSH. Masking requirements for pupil transportation and Head Start programs will remain in place unless changed by the federal government. Last, no students shall be treated differently because of their status of wearing or not wearing a mask or face covering. Do we have a second? I second. Thank you, Ms. Halstead. We have a motion by Ms. Randall, second by Ms. Halstead. Substitute Any discussion? motion. I'd like to make a substitute motion. My motion would be the same as uh, Vice Chair Randall's with the addendum that we released to the public, the legal opinion that we received from our lawyer this past week. There were two emails and she gave us that opinion. Thank you. Second. All right, we have a substitute motion by Dr. Chase with a second by Dr. Warner. Is uh, Ms. Butt right here, do we have, we have discussion on that motion and then we take a vote? We do her vote yeah, first. Yeah, but we have to, we, we discussed that motion, right? Okay. So we will be discussing the substitute motion first. by Dr. Chase. After we have that discussion, we'll vote on that motion. If the motion passes, that will be the vote. If it does not pass, then we will vote on the primary motion. All right, any discussion? Dr. Chase. So um, I, I took an oath to uphold the law. We received a legal opinion that told us that the current universal masking is in place until the law changes. Um, I believe that the law is going to change. Um, in the past, uh, a couple of our board members have in the past voted to make legal opinions public. And I think that in this case, that would be appropriate. Any other discussion? I just have one thing to say, it's Madam Chair, and I, I, I have no problem if the legal opinion is uh, released to the public. I think that's fine. But um, I also believe that we could be opening legal counsel up to substantial criticism as well because the legal opinion is, is semi-one-sided. Um, and I think the public is going to then see that. So I just want to make sure we're clear that's a risk we're taking by releasing that legal opinion. Okay. Any other discussion, Ms. Guy? I don't have a problem releasing it, and you've said more than once that she was either biased or her opinion is one-sided, so it's already been done. Okay. Any other discussion? Dr. Warner, do you have any comments? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I think that all of us, um, I mean, all of us want this mass mandate to end, but we also want um, it to be done safely and um, the one thing that we have asked for from the beginning is parameters. Currently, we're in the midst of a surge. Um, it's, we're down 54% in the past two weeks. That's excellent. But uh, Mary Washington Hospital is still at 95%. I just think those things need to be taken into consideration. But I understand everybody's frustration. And I do question the practicability of keeping students in masks because I think that there are many students who are struggling, especially our early learners. And I think that we do have to, to weigh that into the consideration. Um, I do agree with the, releasing the, the legal position because currently uh, the legislative the legislative body has not kept up with the um, executive orders and the other decisions. And until that happens, I think that um, it's important that we release that legal opinion. But um, other than that, I support this. Okay, any other discussion? 
I did have um, something else I wanted to mention. Um, I appreciated in the motion that Ms. Randall made about um, that it would not be okay for people to be bullied. Um, but I would like to actually see what the plan is going to be to prevent that. Um, we received a digital comment where somebody made a point of how th there have been a few members who've come to speak to us who have ridiculed other members who have been here to speak. And um, we need to make sure that that's not going to happen. And to just for us to just say, you're going to make that not happen, I'd like to know how you're going to make that not happen. Well, I, I, I think that'll be certainly part of the plan, but I would expect that our teachers will model respect and our students will follow the model of their teachers. And I'm sure that every parent, not just here, but in our community, wants their child to be safe and secure at school. And this is actually an opportunity for us to talk to our children about bullying, because we have bullying on all kinds of issues. So, so I would ask every parent to have that discussion with their child. Talk about the freedom and the choice and how everyone has different circumstances. I think that is a message loud and clear to this board that situations are different and that nobody is going to be wrong or criticized for, for that choice. So that's something that I would ask and, and certainly I, I, I expect that's part of Dr. Taylor's rollout plan. I appreciate that the week and I, I know there's a lot of talk started tomorrow, started Monday, but this is something that, that we need to allow time for Dr. Taylor to, to change the signage. You know, our signage is gonna change in every single one of our schools. We're, it's gonna say mask are recommended, but it's not gonna say they're, they're required. And we probably have to do that in a couple of languages too, which is, you know, another factor. But, but I, 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 would, I, would, I would put my trust in Dr. Taylor and to his leadership team, our administrators who have been awesome throughout this. And they're the ones that have really, you know, led, you know, the, the, led the way in the schools. And I, I mean, I know people are frustrated and I thank you for working with us. I, I thank the governor for asking people to trust the legal process and to listen to your principal. So if you could you Can, assure yeah. us, Dr. Taylor, I'm, re I'm ready to yeah. move thank, forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in, the, in the plan that the board had asked me to create in the event that this uh, would happen, um, we made this a cornerstone of that plan. And uh, I will say in the time that the, that the board is allowing in the motion that's on the table right now for consideration, uh, we would have to spend some time uh, in discussion with our staff to make sure that everyone was on the same page and that expectations were clear about how we treat children and how uh, adults are treated and, uh, and what, our, what our dialogue is with young people uh, to make sure that they understand exactly what, we're, what we are doing and how we treat one another. Uh, well, first to clarify, we're, we're still on the substitute motion, right? Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure because we haven't voted on that. But so I want to make one correction. I'm not sure that the public is aware of it or whatever, but the legislative folks have been very in touch with us. I've, been, I've spoken to Philip Scott several times. Um, I know Maureen has been in conversation with Tara Durant, and Philip Scott did send a letter to the board. Um, Dr. Warner didn't get one because she's not here. I mean, she probably got the email. I don't know if she had a chance to look at it. Um, but there is a copy at every desk. And so there is a legislative opinion from a person standing right on the floor there. Um, and just to address an issue, uh, um, I, you know, from my perspective, a legal opinion is given fr from two sides of the coin. And I really feel like that's not been done. The, the legal opinion that we, we are given is supposed to create a concept in our minds that we can wrap our heads around, not a single path. And I, I believe the way I've been reading this stuff, I've been given a single path. And so that's caused me to reach out for extra information. So I think we need to be clear that when the public reads this, it's likely they're gonna see some of them, not all, I don't ever mean to be, you know, inclusive but of that. But at the end of the day, it, I'm just saying, it's, it's pretty clear that there are many takes 
on the way both of those cases were decided. So that's all I wanted to say. I just, that is how I feel about what the information we've received. That's all. And, but I have no problem having it released. I think it's a solid motion. Can I, Ms. Randall, yeah. uh, let me just, yeah. I absolutely, um, I, don't, I don't have a problem with the legal opinion being released. Um, one of the things that I had said previously was that um, with our legal opinion, there was something that I was looking for. I wanted a, a this or a this, and I, we were given 1303 or EO2. And, you know, of course, a lot of the school boards had their meetings with their legal team behind closed doors like we did. And so it was very difficult for me to find what other boards did. So thankfully for VSBA, I was able to find a couple of other school board members from a couple of other districts and just ask them, like, how did you do this? And it, for them, it wasn't a 1303 versus, it was an and. And that's what I was looking for. So I really don't mind releasing her opinion. She is a professional. She has helped us plenty. I don't have a problem with that. There was a, the practicability is a really hard one for me. And, you know, I know some people think that when um, the vote doesn't go their way that we didn't listen. Um, absolutely we listen. And practicable was the one word that we were getting stuck on. It wasn't necessarily well, it was the CDC stuff because we had to be practicable or whatever, but it was that word that was really getting us stumped. And so, but what really was, uh, I mean, you talk about a crappy and a happy. I mean, it's crappy that we all have to sit for hours on end like this, but the happy is, is that you as parents have taught us a lot too about, because when we go in the schools and the kids are masked and teachers are taught, but this is just different. This is raw data, raw information about what the kids are feeling like. Um, I, I know a couple of parents, things that were said have really, really stuck with me to, to bring out the point how not practicable this is anymore. Um, because, and I mean, like I said, I've never really liked doing this before, but I always was, I was a little leery um, because of the legal opinion. I just felt I just have to make sure I don't mess up. Um, but I feel, and it was crappy. But then I know you tell crappy stories about how the masks are, but it, for me, makes me happy because I can feel the decision is a lot easier to do what is practicable for our students and staff and visitors. Um, our schools are communities, and I'm, I'm going to tell you, one of the things, I mean, we can be a divided community, I get it. I would love if you guys came back every week for every meeting for the rest of the year. I would love it um, because it keeps us, it helps us too. We're only single people amongst, you know, 30,000 students and almost 5,000 employees and 33 buildings. It helps us when you talk to us. You don't have to yell at us. If you want to, you can. <laughs> but you definitely can talk to us. We're listening. We can't talk back. <laughs> We're listening. Um, but I just really appreciated looking at some of the other school districts' information, too, for those that are nervous or fearful or worried or whatever, to look at Virginia Beach, which is larger than us, to look at Spotsy, which is just slightly smaller than us, but nearby neighbor, and see that their data doesn't look much different than ours right now. We're masked, they're not. Um, that to me, you know, if I was a worried person, that would help me, that would help me. Um, I'm not a big, you know, all the different data things. Um, I just am a little more about trends, but I know this isn't practicable to keep going. We've heard it over and over again. Our 504 and our IEP kids, this isn't going to work. Our language learners, my son was a first year first grade teacher last year. That's really hard. Um, and, you know, he, it was a really hard struggle for him. Um, special needs. Our middle school and high school, the engagement piece. I have a high schooler um, and he's masked up. And it's very, very hard for him to even as a senior be interested, a lot of his friends, to be interested in even going on to college because his sister is in college, masked up, and she's like, I hate it. I'm out of here early, Mom. 
And so I get it. I get all of those practicable things. I know it as a mom. I hear it as you from as citizens. My only thing going forward, though, I have to say a huge thank you to Dr. Taylor and his staff. I know all of us feel very, very lucky to have our security teams, our video teams, our, you know, our all of our heads that we've had sitting with us for all these late hours and then an early morning. Um, I really just have to say thank you. I mean, you just hopped right in. But what's really cool, though, is having you all sit for his first budget presentation for us. Because I know you guys learned something, too. We definitely learned a different way of doing budgeting. Um, but now I feel like when we ask you, can you please help us across the street? You sent us a lot of emails, not one, a lot of emails, <laughs> and multiple addresses from the same household, a lot of them. <laughs> we know that. And then we got the ones that were part of the chain. We got those too. But I would ask that this group stay together, please, and get those letters as a community, same force, same fierceness, across the street so that we can do the amazing things. We got to rebuild now. And you know, to have a board, I mean, this is a, we're, we're hard working and we're hard working together. And you know, we, we have a name for each other, but that's okay. But I just say, if you can help us do that. The second thing I'm gonna ask is with just as much fierceness, with just as much community grouping, can you please love on our teachers? They are exhausted. They are exhausted. <laughs> you know, having, again, having, you know, I, I've been a teacher. I have one of my students still here again tonight. Yeah. Woo um, but having been a teacher, I know, and then my mom was one, my son was one in this county. And I know Sarah's one just at the college level. It's just a struggle there too, getting kids to turn stuff in. Um, if you could just love on these teachers, they are so exhausted. And yes, it is the masking, but they have a, a real pride in themselves to raise our kids up. And it is so hard for them to raise our kids up and feel good when they're exhausted, of course, masking, of course, worrying about the kids and how they're doing. But also, it's a real, um, they have a perfectionism in them. And they feel like, when your kids aren't perfect where they want them to be, that's their fault. And it's just, it's a really hard place where we are right now. So two things, use all of your email accounts, email the supervisors, use all of your email accounts, love on your teachers, have a pep rally for them, have a, you know, bring a Kona ice truck for them, send them a bucket of thank you notes, just send them an email. I send, I've always, anybody who's ever had my youngest son, in a class, I always volunteered to pay for their retirement if they would just get him through that year. Because <laughs> he's just that one. He's the reason this is gray. It just happens to be that way. Um, so those are, those are what I would ask of our community. Please keep coming back. Bring more friends. Talk to us about the problems. We'd love to have more community meetings. We've been impressed with who's come to each of our, our um, magisterial districts and spoke to us and met with Dr. Taylor. I mean, I don't know how he has the energy. Um, this over 50 woman here <laughs> is exhausted and I know you guys are too, but I'm really, really proud that as a board, as hard as it, this is, a decision for some of us that just, you know, dropped us to our knees and I'm not gonna lie, in my closet last night, three hours of sleep. I mean, I'm just, it's exhausting to feel what you're feeling. I'm not not empathetic. I'm not not sympathetic. But I want you to love on the people that feel differently than you too and not to put them up on a social media picture or a, you know, a group you know, thing. Like, love on them too. Um, because this is what we need to move our kids. We're going to be amazing. Thank you, Ms. Randall. Madam Sorry. Chair, <clears throat> Madam Chair, I've been told that Dr. Warner would like to speak after Here's Dr. Here. Chase. Okay. Well, okay. what? Have you spoken yet, Dr. Chase? Yeah, when she got hers. Okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm going to go around. Did you? Oh, so you were, do we want to vote on the? 
No, well, we're still we are still, we still talking still about people that haven't. Well, haven't I know, but I, we're talking about both motions well, at one time and then voting. Well, it's, it's, it's actually the same motion. The only difference between the Ms. Randall's motion and Dr. Chase's motion is that Dr. Chase's motion adds to that of releasing the legal opinions. That's the only difference between these two motions. So everything that Ms. Randall read is what is under consideration plus releasing the legal opinions to the public. Okay. Ms. Guy, did you have any comments or? Um, I already said I'm, I'm okay with this. Oh, okay. All right. Well, any, uh, Ms. Sigmund? I'm under the impression we're talking about motion two. Yes, then, yes. Okay. Um, just that I feel like I know myself over the past two years, I've become pretty adept at reading legal opinions. Um, the difference is that this is, you know, my tax dollars have paid for this and it's not at this time protected you know, a protected topic. I have no problem with it. I mean, might even be for the best for them to read. I don't think it's a secret uh, based on the conversation up here, what they're going to read. So tax dollars at work. I think it's important. Okay. Dr. Warner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I know everybody's impatient. I know this has been a really rough two years. Believe it or not, we're as tired of the masks as you are. We're as tired of trying to juggle, um, the mitigation strategies in COVID-19 as parents are. But unfortunately, it's a reality that we're, we're stuck in. Um, I ask you to be a little patient a little bit longer. Um, it's important that um, we work with our schools and our administrators and our teachers and make sure everybody is on board and comfortable with this move forward. And we make sure that we have the um, N9, the correct masks in place for those people who choose to wear them because there is a difference between the masks. Um, each school is a community, and so we have to respect the fact that there are different people with different needs within those communities. And, and that's why we just ask to be respectful, because you don't know what burden other people may carry or why they may choose to wear a mask or why they may need to wear a mask. And it's just important to respect that as well. Thank you. And again, love on our teachers. They've been, this last two years has been ex is rough on them, if not rougher than it has been on the parents. Ms. Halstead, did you want to yeah, finish uh, your remarks? I have a couple of things to say. So, um, you know, I started this whole thing having come from the public health field um, and worked in emergency management, public health emergency management for so long. Um, and I feel like the battle that we've undertaken here isn't really fighting amongst ourselves. And, and to take a couple of moments of public comment here to talk about credible sourcing and whatever the situation is. I'm not sure either side of the fence has a credible source, but what we have are two sides of the coin. And so there's the, this one side that one group wants to believe, and then there's this other side that the other group reads and they want to believe it. And in the process, we stopped looking objectively at the information and weighing it. We pitted it against each other instead of weighing what from each of it made sense. And then we kept ratcheting it up notches. And from there, that's where all the dissension and the craziness came. Look, we're all guilty of having, I mean, we all grew up a certain way. We all have a certain way of thinking that's supposed to be the beauty of America. It's supposed to be what makes us great. Those differences, the way that we can share those differences with each other. And somewhere along the line here, we stopped sharing those differences. I'm guilty of it too, because I'm rooted in not just the belief system, but in this process of, I mean, at what point do you turn around and say, I hear what you're saying, I just don't agree with it, and have the other person say, okay, and I don't agree with you. We lost somewhere along the lines the ability to agree to disagree respectably or respectfully, and I think that's our biggest challenge moving forward is closing up some of those wounds that we all have, healing what, and I've been saying this from the beginning, healing what misinformation has done. Not my misinformation, not your misinformation, misinformation. Because regardless of what's going on up above Stafford County, none of those people are here in Stafford County. But we allowed them to infiltrate us. At, in, for lack of a better word, we allowed what we've been hearing on this media, and I don't like that media anymore, so I'm gonna go to this media, and my media is better than your media, and all of the sudden, we are hamsters in a wheel, and we can't stop spinning. And I can tell you for a fact, 
listening to some of the speakers tonight, what fascinates me about it is the people that are, have a different view than me, we're actually the same people. We just have a different thought process, right? Our main goal this whole time has been kids and normalcy for kids. There is no doubt in this world that the kids are the number one priority here. They are our future and we are responsible for them every step of the way. That's the immunocompromised kids, that's the ESL students, that's our autistic children, that's our gifted kids. We are responsible for them. This board has a duty to respect parental authority, I think, as a priority moving forward, and I think that is one lesson we should never let ourselves forget ever. Now, let me just say two more things about it. So I heard, and the reason why I say we are the same person, I heard someone say earlier. I said we are discussing the motion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So our, um, as we were talking about this, I heard a lot of the I, we, we say I, my, me. I get in trouble a lot because I forget that I, my, me, I really mean we, us, you, them. You can ask my sister. I'm terrible at grammar. Pronouns are included, punctuation, anything like that. Um, but we have the opportunity today with this motion and with moving forward to really build the we for what we want it to be. And I suggest we take that opportunity and we run with it because we certainly took the I opportunity very quickly. I think what we've proposed here is great. We have about six days, right? Six school days. Um, more, you're probably going to have like a lot more than that but we've got a three-day weekend in there and whatever i think it's i think it's such a great compromise and i think it starts to stitch up the wounds and i hope that we can move forward here from today all of us and just walk up to the next person we see and be like hey you and i disagreed on that thing remember the time we went at it on social media let's go have a beer and talk about it because that's what america should be that's a baby all right, I, I just want to make um, final comments. Well, I, okay. Oh, no, actually, I didn't address, I addressed your question that how are we going to do that. I haven't addressed the motion, so I, I want to address the motion. Um, I'm going to support this motion because I have no objection to releasing legal opinions, and while a recommendation or it's not a recommendation advice is given to the board the board has discretion and the Supreme Court's decision which did not uphold the executive order it dismissed the Chesapeake case there was and I'll call it dicta it's not part of the decision because the decision was the case was dismissed but it did state and reinforce the Senate bill 1303 necessarily gives the boards, that's the school boards, a degree of discretion to modify or even forego the strategies, and those are the strategies from the CDC, as they deem appropriate for their individual circumstances. And my support, not only of you know, releasing the legal opinions, but of this motion is that at this point, I feel that it is not practicable. And we keep going back to the word. If you all were here last summer, that was my thing, practicable. But at that point, it was determined to be practicable. We used it. But since this issue has risen to the top, I feel that I have gotten a lot of information, a lot of facts, real facts, that in my opinion, shows that this is not practicable for our community. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to recommend masking, because we will continue to recommend it, but we will not require it. I want to make sure, because we've gotten a lot of correspondence from staff, that staff says, please, if you're not going to require the students, you know, let me off the hook. Let me get rid of it and and this that that was in this in this motion is that that this decision applies to staff but please be aware that there is a what is it the Virginia Department of what yeah. um, it's actually Virginia Occupational Safety and Health 
Um, okay. So they, they, ha they actually have a, a state requirement, but actually right now, under Executive Order 6, the governor has actually asked that those regulations be right. reviewed um, and gave uh, Vosh uh, 30 days to do that. So that, that, yeah. that clock is ticking. Up next so week. so um, should that change, according to your motion that's on the table right now, um, staff would be included right. in, in uh, uh, the relinquishment right. of the so year. So this board is doing what is in our discretion to release the staff, but it's, it's, this is outside of us, but at such time as that order changes, then uh, Dr. Taylor will immediately let everyone know. And, and please, I, I think it was significant, the bus drivers that came up. They're, it's not their fault. This is the federal government. This is in, in CDC, these are not guidelines, this is a CDC order. This is why we have to wear them at the airports. This is why we have to wear them on any public transportation. And they have determined and identified school buses as public transportation. So there is no discretion, we have no control over that. The motion says at such time is, is that's not in place, we won't have to do it, but until then, we are required by the federal order to have masks on our school buses. So if there's help you can give, you know, in that, I, I think, I, yes, I, I mean, God bless our drivers because they, uh, they're here for us and, and they're, they're doing a great job now getting kids to and from school so help us out help us out with that as well so that's you know my, my point here I've, I've said all along you know, I'm looking at the law the legal opinion gives us advice but I I believe that we have discretion under the law to make this change all right so do we want to do a second round we'll start with dr. chase and after that we'll well, this is last chance we'll end the comments yeah so I, I did want to just remind people, I, I, I don't know when uh, Mr. Scott was elected, but um, throughout this whole two years, um, it's been like past the decisions down to the lowest level of governance. Um, so I've been on dealing with this since the pandemic started, and um, I find it interesting that suddenly people want to, from higher up, want to make suggestions when they had the opportunity to make those laws when this pandemic started. Um, so, Excuse me, no, oh, so, this yeah. is a dialogue yeah. among the board. The yeah. sooner we get our discussion done, the sooner we'll vote and you can all go home. Right. Um, and, and we can too. Right. And so I, I, I will not be supporting the motion. I, I want the legal opinion out there so that people will understand why I've tried to be consistent. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I'm just going to have to rely on the legal opinion that we received. Um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm concerned that the 22nd is a little too soon, um, and I would be happy to wait for um, Virginia, you know, the, the General Assembly and the governor to go through the correct process. So I just want to make people understand why. I'm suddenly voting no, and they're like, oh, how, how did that happen? So thank you. All right, well, we'll to go down the line. Uh, Dr. Warner, do you have anything you want to add? No, Madam Chair, I've said everything I need to say. Okay, thank you. Ms. Sigmund. Um, I think I would be remiss. Uh, I think you've all heard the story about the child throwing the starfish back in, and the beach is covered in starfish, and they come up to them and say, you're never going to save them all. Why, like, why are you even trying? And the child says, because it matters to that one. So in the interest of all of that ones we have in Stafford County, I have to ask the question, do we have to wait until the 22nd? In addition to that, I also want to make sure that if we do get... Um, Excuse me. Remember, this is a board discussion. I want to make sure that if we get a change from Richmond in advance of the 22nd, do we automatically have to follow that? Is that part of the, I know there were all different laws at the bottom that you said we would change on behalf of, but if the General Assembly and the governor make this available before the 22nd, do we still go to the 22nd? Do we, 
I don't, like, legally speaking, where do we stand there? In any case, for as many children as are struggling, I think, you know, a week is better than three months, but I think a day is too long. And if we can do anything to get as many children comfortably back in school learning, I think that is our ultimate goal, um, safely, as, you know, as safely as possible, of course, but, you know, we have the flexibility to do it now. We are within our legal right to do it now. We are, you know, like, I just, I hesitate to wait a moment longer. You know, you talk about instructional hours and how few we have already. Um, and that's a whole lot of instructional hours that we could possibly have the option to give. Um, and I just feel like we should discuss whether or not that's at all feasible, practicable, possible. This guy. Are we still talking about the amendment? Well, we're, the, right, but, the, but it, it's the whole, the, the, uh, the motion that we're going to be voting on is the same motion read by Ms. Yeah, Randall with the ad addition of the legal okay. opinion so right, so, so it, it okay, is all it's asking. all in one okay. all right because I wasn't sure why we were going back when I already said well like because that, Ms. Okay. no I understand Doc, Dr. Okay. Chase wanted to speak again so I wanted to give everybody so we're, an we're opportunity moving on to the even though yes as soon as we finish the line we'll take a vote on the second. on on the second motion and the motion but well the motion two votes I mean two all right that would be two different votes we would have added a little piece to her motion. okay and if all right fails, then we go immediately to vote one, the original one. Okay. All right. right. So, um, I, I've listened obviously to everyone's comments. I took my notes. Um, I heard multiple times over, you know, the multiple comments about, you know, <coughs> we're not listening or we're not hearing people, which is you know, really impossible to not listen and to not hear. In emails, we get, you know, hear my voice as a subject, you know, in, in capital letters. So your voices are heard, whether I vote to agree with it or not. You, we are listening to you. Um, but I also listen to people in my district. And even though I do have people in my district who want me to vote one way, I still have people in my district who want me to vote another way. I think um, both opinions are, are, are valid. People's, people's feelings are valid. Their lived experiences matter, but I still have heard more from people in my district, not here tonight, or not, you know, I'm talking about acquired district people that have told me, and I voted for the law. I didn't vote on my opinion. My personal opinion happened to go with the law, but I voted on the law, just like you did. Even though your personal opinion wasn't to go with it, but you voted for the law, so did I. I had responses back, you know, thank you for, you know, this or that. I'm not supporting, I voted for the law. That being said, people in my district are telling me, don't change your vote. No, Even, not. yes, they no, are. Uh, excuse me. Ex ex excuse me, if, <laughs> if we have any more interruptions of the board member's comment, we're gonna ask the person who interrupted to leave. And her name's Juliet, but here's the point. The point is, you don't know every person in my district, neither do I. I only know the people who walk up to me or who email me or who call me. That's all I know, or people on Facebook Messenger or whatever. That's, that's what I know. And I'm telling you, I have heard more from people telling me not to change my vote than I have from people telling me to. That's it. Now, maybe your friend circle is, is completely different or your neighbors are completely different. I'm not saying you're, you're wrong. I'm just telling you what I've heard. I also believe that our districts are different and, and you can't say the same thing that I'm saying and, and be truthful, but I can. So I'm, that's, I'm torn, that's where, that's where I'm at. Thank you, Ms. Guy. Ms. Halstead? Um, this is a lot to take in. Um, you know, there isn't gonna be a perfect day to start this because we're not in agreement for how this was, we're not even in agreement with how this was handled from the beginning. Um, it's never easy. I remember just, you know, <laughs> shoulder surgery, right? And so my arm is in this sling and I'm dreading this PT. I'd already gone through 12 years of not being able to move my shoulder, right? Because of torn rotator cuffs and everything else. Um, but I don't, you know, if I wanna use my arm again, I have to go to PT and start somewhere. I have to get, and I can remember that first day standing at that 
right there and the PT guy saying, okay, lift your arm. And I'm like, I mean, I'm looking at it, but, and I know my brain is telling it to move, but it's not happening. But what did I do? I picked my arm up with the other arm and I moved it up the wall. And so I guess my point is, is that it's time to pick up our arms and move them up the wall. We just, we, there are two, the kids that came out tonight to say, please don't do this to me anymore. I mean, I don't know what speaks louder than that. And I don't know if it's even the parents that speak louder than that. The kids have begged us. And that stresses me out beyond all reasonable belief. Because in no situation in America today should we be using the words when it comes time to parents, allow. Never. I don't allow you to do anything. I don't pay your bills. I don't snuggle with your child at night when they're having a nightmare. I don't worry about what foods they're eating. I barely worry about what foods I'm eating. But anyway, um, but I, I feel like for us to sit up here as a board and to argue that the, the law is so succinctly word by word specific, when we all know things have, the law can adapt and adjust as the law wants to. And that's just the way it is. We've seen that work over and over and over again in time. I mean, lawyers are lawyers because they take the law, they take the circumstance, they put them together, and they argue the point. And we're looking at each word being like, OK, so um, who is there? Who, right, who is there? Who is who? And then we talk about that for 25 minutes and is, who is is, and then we, so this is why I'm frustrated as well with the legal opinions that we've been given. It's very succinctly the same thing, follow this. Um, Madam Chairman, your interpretation is 100% correct. The most important thing that came out of the Supreme Court case the other day wasn't an upholding of EO2. It was the validation that SB 1303 allows this board to opt out of unrealistic, harmful mandates in the face of what is becoming a part of our everyday lives. And I know that's hard to accept. Teenagers get a pimple. How long does it take them to accept that pimple on their face, right? This is what we're looking at now. It's just going to be harder. And if we don't get started, we're not lifting our arm ever again, and we're not using it. Madam Chair, uh, Ms. Sigmund does deserve an answer to a couple of her questions. Uh, one of her questions was if the motion on the floor stands uh, and uh, the law changes or is signed into law in the governor's uh, office under emergency powers, which takes effect first? And as a matter of fact, the, the law as signed by the governor would take effect first if it was signed ahead of the date that's noted uh, in the motion that's on the table. I will say that the plan that I presented to this board earlier in the week uh, did include things like making sure we did have a supply for student KN95 masks and that sort of thing. We have ordered them. They have not arrived. It is an advantage for us to have a little bit of lead time in any type of change management to make sure that we can do this seamlessly and that we actually do it the right way. Um, I, we're definitely ready uh, in terms of our sentiment and, and are able to move at the board's will, but there are advantages to making sure that we can do things the right way, and that's part of what we want to do to make sure that the classroom experience is a positive one for all kids. And it is going to take effort, to Dr. Chase's point, and it is going to take effort, to your point, to make sure that our signage reflects what the board's intent is. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Randall? Anything else? I'm going to be quiet. Let's vote. Okay. Madam Chair, so I'll I, vote. All right. I want to just confirm, make sure there's no procedural glitches here. We're voting on the substitute amendment, and we are voting on this as a whole, correct? correct. So a vote to approve this, 
A yes vote means that this passes. A no vote means it doesn't. If this vote does not pass, then we go back to the original motion by Ms. Randall, which does not include release of the legal opinion. And I would ask if this vote passes for this substitute motion, that those legal opinions be posted as soon as possible tomorrow on the website. Madam Chair, we can include that yes. with the correspondence that goes to families uh, tomorrow morning uh, when we send out our, our notice as, as to the board's okay. intent. Thank you. All right, so all in favor of the substitute motion, which is exactly as Ms. Randall read, plus releasing the legal opinions sent to the board, please say aye. 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 All opposed? No. No. Madam Clerk, would you pull the board, please? Yes, ma'am. Dr. Chase? No. Ms. Guy? No. Ms. Halstead? Yes. Ms. Healy? Yes. Ms. Randall? Yes. Ms. Seaman? Yes. And Dr. Warner? Yes. Madam Chair? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, can I?